My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The atmosphere is so charged and um, it's going to be a challenge given the, the topic that will define the direction of our proceedings tonight. So it's important that we calm it down a bit so that we can do a little bit of Bible study. If we flow with the euphoria of the atmosphere, we will be distorted from the present emphasis that the Holy Ghost wants to bring to us in the course of this meeting. So you have to pardon me to calm it down a bit. Hallelujah. <laughs> I want to quickly appreciate the leadership of the engineering students for having me here in APU Zaria. <laughs> it's a great honor and I don't take it for granted. <laughs> Thank you. I love you too. <laughs> It's a great honor, it's a great honor. And um, honestly, I don't take it for granted. I want to appreciate the ministers that have come up earlier. Thank you so much for blessing us with the presence of God. Tonight, we will we will pray. We'll take our time to pray. We'll stretch a bit in the spirit and trust the Lord to see what He will do in our midst. Can you just lift your hands toward heaven and talk to the Lord very briefly? This is the time where you separate from the crowd. The Bible says they go from strength to strength. Every one of them that appeareth in Zion before the Lord. Strength in the kingdom is a function of appearance in the presence. A man that does not understand the mystery, the technology and the systems of appearing in the presence is a man that will faint in the day of battle because his strength will be small. The economy of strength in the kingdom is fabricated in your ability to stand in the present. They say they go from strength to strength. You can be locked up. You can be lost in the congregation. But you will not make appearance in Zion. Can you whisper from the very depths of your heart? Talk to Jesus tonight that he may find you in the midst of the crowd. The Bible said, Bartimaeus cried out. And he stopped the protocol. Jesus had to locate him. Do you know how to cry? Some of us have mastered a lot of things, but we don't know how to apprehend the master. Come on. Kambra safate belege barash. Kariana Tabra Sebelana Tragadia Suvri Nahas Kamilu Rahambres Kabadia Saliandra Paras Zedelegapara Bandra Zedesh Ambre Sekete Palababrumbro Sapararas Kamala kabaska bala babaska ba. Lift your voice toward heaven. Call upon the name of the Lord. Not in matches, not in beats. Your engagement of the spirit realm for yourself. You can sit under mighty anointings. You can be imparted by great men of God. But if you don't engage the spirit realm for yourself, brother, you can't travel far. And that's where many of us lack strength. 
We see men, we are excited, but we can't touch the Holy Ghost. Come on, you want to talk to God tonight? You reign, you ancient Zion's king, Kadosh, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion's king, Kadosh, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. You reign, you reign, you reign. You reign, you reign, you reign. Ah, you are mighty. over this territory that have been built by the prophecies of the fathers. We align ourselves with the utterances of the patriarchs that have walked the borders of this land. We latch onto the covenants that they caught with you and the promises that they received on account of faithfulness. And even as we look up to you tonight, Lord, we ask that you will reign upon us bounties of your presence that sustains the capacity to transform us for good so that the texture of our service in the kingdom will be one that will pass the taste of the immortals. Thank you Holy Spirit in Jesus precious name. You may be seated. God bless you.
Oh my God. God bless you. You know, whenever you have the privilege to enter a territory that is rich, that is so blessed with spiritual resources, you understand that you are walking a terrain where the counsel of God is always looming in the atmosphere. And oftentimes the crisis of the believer is his inability to satisfy the requirements of alignment. You would wonder why a man will walk with Jesus for three years and that man will pass the test of becoming the son of perdition. It defies our understanding of the doctrine of transformation. Because captured in the doctrine of transformation are three cardinal spiritual resources that are responsible for orchestrating transformation in the soul of a man. One of it is the word of the Lord. The truth of his kingdom. When a man begins to interface with the word of the Lord sufficiently, it is natural for his system, his design, his makeup to begin to respond to the energy of that life. And transformation becomes a natural reality. So he said, we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in the glass, the image of the Lord, we are changed. How then will a man walk with Jesus, hearing the very spoken word of God for three years, and then transformation is not a possibility in his life? It draws our attention to the fact that in this kingdom, you don't make progress only by what God has to supply. There is a responsibility requirement for every believer in order to walk into the full heritage of God. Another spiritual resource that is responsible for transformation is the presence of God. And the Bible said concerning Jesus that he was the fullness. He said he pleased the Father that the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in him body. How can somebody interact with Jesus at such close proximity? And then he still passes the test of being the son of perdition. He draws our attention to the cry of Paul where he said, We should walk out our faith with fear and with trembling. I say this as a remark and a note to begin with because we are in a territory that is invested so much with the presence of the word of God and custodians of the mysteries of the kingdom and if we are not careful the things we have at our disposal will become the very reason why we will trivialize the very scarce spiritual commodities that is responsible for our transformation therefore we may begin to do so much but when we are weighed on the scales of eternal balances, we will discover that we are light. The worst thing that happens to a man is not death. I've heard a lot of quotes. But when I read the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13 verse 27, I now saw that it was possible to cross the borders of eternity. And when you arrive at the other side, where there is no room for making correction anymore, after you have done so mightily on earth, then God will tell you, away from me, walker of iniquity. <laughs> what, what have I done that passes the taste of being a walker of iniquity? I drank in your presence. I ate in your presence. How does drinking from your fountain and in your presence and walking in your presence translate to walking iniquity? I thought... Every transaction that is carried out in the presence of God, we pass the test of God. How does eating and drinking in your presence translate to walking in iniquity? So it is possible for a man, after having done so much, passing theological test, we now cross over to eternity and discover that everything he did was a waste. Because there is a law of eternal consolidation. And it is on the strength of that law that the potency of our Christian life can be defined. So when we see subjects like 
we have to look upon tonight. Then we have to put away all the frenzies of Christianity, the euphoria, and settle down to look at the facts. What are the things that spirit judge? If God were to come and look upon your life today, what do you think he will look at? Have you checked the scriptures to find out the commodities in the spirit that you have as a, an ingredient in your work with God that the mortars are interested in? When a spirit comes to access your work with him, what are the things, what are the exact things he looks at? Have you taken time to check the scriptures to find out what are those things that pleases his spirit? Because when I begin to read the scriptures, most of the times, I get troubled. Because when I look at the Christianity that has been handed over to us and the things we celebrate, I discover that these things were byproducts in the days of the patriarchs. And when their lives were recounted and God came to judge the texture of their service, most of the things we hold so high were not realities that God even considered. Even though they are very important. I now discovered we need to look at our lives again and find out the direction that we should go. Life is too important. The stakes are too high to allow yourself to become an experiment. I refuse to be an experiment. I refuse to be. The stakes are too high. When you realize that the breath on your nostrils can be taken away, and then the moment it is taken away, you appear in a place where they begin to judge every thought in your heart, every action you ever carried out, every word you ever spoke, is now weighed on the balances. Then I begin to ask God, how then is it possible to pass your test? You know, the scripture we are about to look at tonight is not necessarily for sinners. It is for those who are saved. That means to be honorable, to be useful in the hand of God is not necessarily a function of eternal life. It means to be useful in the hand of God is not necessarily a function of the fact that you have Jesus. To be useful in the hand of God is what you have become on account of the Jesus that you have on your inside. Because the scripture was not written for sinners. In fact, from the, the, first, the verses before 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 21 that we'll be considering tonight, Paul had to first of all compare us with the Gentiles before he began to talk to us. Because if we are not careful, we will be blown away. Did you notice while reading your Bible that it is the church that manifested the highest gift of the Spirit that were called babes? You know, I didn't come to say so much. Well, just in case you came to see power and revival, sorry I will disappoint you. I, I want us to talk brotherly talk this evening. So that as you go home, you will sit down and contemplate your life once again. Those days where the father sat down for three days, and they were checking the things that were important. We don't have them anymore. Now we come, we judge, we look at a lot of parameters. How is it possible for a man to dwell in the midst of fire, yet he's carrying addiction for many years? How is it possible for a man to come and move in the power of God? Yes, he's a puppet. Yet he's a puppet in the hand of the devil. What is the intelligence that is informing perversion in our generation? How did the patriarchs guide against this kind of demonic intelligence? That in their days, their manifestation rested comfortably on the foundation of their quality and work with God. How is it possible now that we can have manifestation yet we don't have depth? We don't have foundation. What is the intelligence informing the perversion? Is it possible now that some of the things we do are even facilitated by spirits that are not the Holy Ghost. How is it possible that a prophet will stand up from the bed of immorality and then he comes to flow in word of knowledge and then there's nobody in the environment to even discern? What even this prophet, nothing moves in his conscience anymore. What what is going on in our generation? Sadhusa Baraj came to Nigeria and he came to cry because there is an army that is rising that will be fueled by the spirit of immorality. We are crying revival. 
many are on fire, running from pillar to post. But when you check the texture of our ranking in the spirit, you realize that many who are on the microphone burning, they are in one way or the other connected to the spirit of immorality. So before the revival begins, the very army that have been ordained by divine intelligence have already been compromised before the journey began. So you and I know that we, God wants to use us. You and I know that we are on fire for Jesus. But there is an infirmity in our soul that we cannot deal with. And we have come to a point where we feel that one day something will happen. So we are doing what we are doing. We come to church. We are so conscious about the people that will fall down. Listen, there is nothing wrong in manifestation. But why is it that the power of God that we wield nowadays have no authority to deal with the infirmities in our soul? How did the patriarchs do it? Let's look at the scriptures. What did Jesus look at? That he will come and consider Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and all the prophets. And then the very John that the Bible says, John did no miracles. Jesus will now say, no man born of a woman is greater than John. What was he looking at exactly? I don't understand. If I remember correctly, Elijah called down fire from heaven. What were the parameters that he was looking at? It means spirits don't judge the way we judge. <laughs> ah! What was he looking at exactly? I don't understand how John was more important than Moses. I, I, can't, I can't find it. I can't understand it. It was Moses that said, God will raise a prophet like unto me. According to stature and ranking in the spirit, on account of the places where Moses entered in his walk with God, he understood that he was the one that mirrored the dimension of the Christos. He said, the prophet that you are waiting for, he will be like me. Do men talk like that? Yet this one came with the lenses of the immortals. And then he said, there is none among the prophets that is greater than John. What were the parameters that he was looking at? I want to show us something today that borders on spiritual texture. Our Christianity doesn't have texture. We have manifestation, we have no texture. That's the crisis of the 21st century Christianity. Manifestation, no texture. Check your life, you understand what I'm talking about. Don't look far. At the age of 12, Jesus was a master of the Torah. At the age of 12, the Bible said he spoke with doctors of the law. He asked them questions they could not answer. He answered the questions. That means it was if it was a function of your ability to interact, interpret the scripture. If it was a, on the basis of revelation and rema, if it was on the basis of doctrinal exegesis, at the age of 12, Jesus was the best rabbi in Israel. Why did he wait for 30 years? Why would the ministry of three years rest on the foundation of 30 years? Texture, 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 texture. <laughs> you, you spoke in tongues for six months. And then the fellowship, as you did like this, people fair. The next thing you are lost. <laughs> texture. So Jesus stood up. And when he sent them out, he said, The prince of this world come to me. He findeth nothing. When the devil comes, he's not interested in your manifestation. He can create it. There is something the devil cannot create is the life of God. Any man that carries the life of God in his foundation, that man is a threat in the demonic realm. So Jesus built 30 years on the ground in order to carry out the ministry of what? Of three and a half years. Why was texture so important? People come from meeting, they fall down, they roll down, they cry for three days. 
and then they get up after two weeks, they go back to immorality. No. There's a crisis. There's a crisis. There's a crisis. Manifestation could not rest on texture. Jesus said, all that you have given me, no one, not one, not one is falling except the son of perdition. And the reason he's falling is that the scriptures might be fulfilled. How did he sustain so much texture? I want to show us something today that is at the center of Christian work. The molecule that defines the texture of your work with God. This is what the fathers knew. And I will show you how their Bible studies look like. I will show you how that their Bible study is different from ours. You know, there are three major kinds of Bible study. There is an informative Bible study. Where you can gather information is very important. Because those informations become raw materials that the Holy Ghost breathes upon. There is a revelational Bible study. Where the mind of God is unveiled. But there is also another level of Bible study that only the Holy Ghost is the teacher in that class. It's called transformational Bible study. That was the one the elders of old were masters of. So everything they learned, they became. They manifested because they received the clearance to become. Their becoming was rather the clearance that gave them right to manifestation. So concerning Jesus, the Bible said he began of all that he began to do and to teach. So when Jesus talks about holiness, it's first of all his reality. So if Jesus talks to you about holiness, you cannot but become holy. The first day I met Apostle Warum <laughs> he said when he speaks, he deposits God. His idea is not to educate you. You will be educated in the process. But he's interested in depositing God. So you may leave the meeting, you don't know what you heard. But things die. Appetites die. And as you leave the meeting, you discover you woke up in the night, you wanted to speak in tongues. Those are your friends that you gossip with, you didn't feel like going to meet them again. Meanwhile, you don't know the verse of the scripture he used when he taught. Because the days when the patriarchs walked with God, the scriptures were not written, yet they were like God. <laughs> That's why the Bible said in Romans 15, 4, it said the things that were written at all time, it said they were written for our learning, so that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. These men, the days when they lived their lives, they had not read it, read, the Bible was not written. How did they know God? You, you try to quote all the scriptures, you follow all the lines of exegesis, and then you recite it from your head, but your spirit is lean. We need to open the scripture so that uh, I'm not lost in talking. You know, sometimes when you travel, you accumulate burdens. You accumulate burdens. Man of God wants us to talk about purging, so we have to keep it calm. If not, we will enter cloud nine and forget that we came for purging. That means the, the emphasis of this teaching tonight is for discipleship. It's not necessarily for manifestations. And um, I'm not under pressure to. We will, we will look at the scriptures and then we will allow the Holy Spirit to minister to people. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. He said, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. And he says, some to honor and some to dishonor. He said, if a man therefore purge himself from this, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. What are the deeds that the man needs to purge himself from? It first of all began from an error in spiritual understanding. In verse 18, that's where the Bible talks what the deeds are. He was citing particularly two persons. Hymenaeus and Philetus. He said, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that there is no resurrection, or the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. He said, nevertheless, the foundation of the law standeth sure. 
That means truth is not something that can be manipulated. So the foundation of their error was predicated upon their enormous revelation. They have come to know so much that they decided to go ahead of the truth of God. And it did not only remain in revelation, it led to lasciviousness and ungodly lifestyle. And this is the crisis of revelation without the life of God as a solid base. These guys had gone too deep in their explanation of doctrines that they have not subjected their lives to the Holy Ghost to define. Have you heard people teaching about prayer, but they don't have a prayer life? These are the kinds of people. But because they do not subject themselves to the Holy Spirit, to drill them until prayer becomes their life, they think it's something they can say by vaporizable intelligence. So when they come, they talk anything they want to talk about prayer. And because it sounds logically correct, they think they are right. So these guys, to them, they don't understand that the resurrection is the foundation upon which the, the life of God rests. To them, resurrection is a teaching. So they come to teach it and they develop dogmas that suit the happenings in their day and time. So they became philosophical in their explanations. They became philosophical in their teaching until a point came when they said there was a resurrection is already past. They thought it was an error that was built on intelligence. But they didn't know that that error was powered by spirit. And over time, as they walked in the direction of that error, they began to drift away from God. So revelation became the undoing of that generation. And he said many lost their faith. He said, but... For you that are in the house, he said, the foundation of God standeth sure. They that name the name of the Lord must depart from iniquity. That means revelation is not born from mental exertion. Revelation is born from obedience to the Holy Ghost. It is the area where the Holy Ghost has authority over your life that you can tap into truth in the kingdom. So he's telling you that the foundation of God, the standards of God, are not a function of mental knowledge. They are a function of obedience. He said, if you name the name of the Lord, begin your journey by departing from iniquity. When you depart, then your doctrine will be accurate. The degree to which you are separated from error through obedience to the Holy Spirit is the degree to which your teaching can be accurate. Teachings are not accurate because they are logically correct. Teachings are accurate because they were inspired by the spirit of truth. So that teaching is a witness to the reality of that spirit. But oftentimes, people who do not have a walk with God want to talk about God. So we have revelations hovering about. Some of them are even rebranded from other teaching. But there is no capacity to touch the texture of the soul. So you can hear many teachings on righteousness, but you wonder why you still struggle. Because they were born from the mind. They were not inspired of the spirit. So Paul began by saying, obedience is the foundation of accurate spiritual revelation. He said, they that name the name of the Lord should depart from iniquity. And then he went further. He now began to explain to us how that we are vessels in the house of God. And who we are does not matter. You may be gold, you may be silver. It doesn't matter. You may be wood, you may be earth. It doesn't matter. He said, what matters is the degree to which you are purged. That means honor in the kingdom is a function of purging. <laughs> you see, sometimes when you begin to teach spiritual truth, it violates phil philosophical teachings. For example, when the spirit says love, what do you think he's saying? It has nothing to do with emotion. Your emotion may be part of it because that's how you are designed. But when a spirit talks about love, he's talking about obedience. He's talking about sacrifice. So Jesus said, if you love me, he didn't say, tell me. I don't want to hear. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So every time you are obeying Jesus, you are actually saying, Jesus, I love you. But how many of us here wake up in the morning and say, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And the guy is loving you, Lord, and is disobeying God. I love you, Lord. 
Then the angels will come and look at you and say, Who is this creature? <laughs> Jesus said, If you love me, the way to declare it is what? Keep my commandments. So every time you obey a spirit, you are making a very strong proclamation of love. The same way the Bible reveals to us that the key to honor is purging, sanctification. He said the day a man begins to purge himself, whether he is at and there is gold, that day a spirit alights upon him and he becomes relevant in the kingdom. Sanctification is the greatest molecule that defines spiritual accuracy. If a Christian have not embarked on the protocol of sanctification, his journey is still far. You may be a leader, you may be known. Let me tell you, in a move, when the move of God begins, it's easy to latch to that move and flow. This move of God that is coming, there are many people that we listen to a lot of messages and have something to say and become popular. But many will be popular at the expense of being rooted. So they have no root in God, but they are popular. By the time the crisis comes, they will float away like chaffs before the wind. Sanctification is that molecule that defines your essence in the spirit. The Bible said the day purging becomes your way of life. He said that day, even if it's only singing, you are singing in church, you will be more relevant to God than the guy who is talking to 10,000 people. Because there is a way spirits judge. You will not understand. Because there are many things that you can't communicate. Unless you become fused to the spirit that bets life. And it is that spirit that determines the texture and the quality of your work. I give an instance all the time. You may come for a service. And then I came to preach for 60 minutes. And then another lady came and sang for 5 minutes. And then a spirit comes into the service and wants to judge. Captured in the ordination of that lady is to activate gifts of the spirit through her voice. That means her voice, worship for her, is not just praising the name of the Lord and extolling him. Worship for her is a system in the spirit that has the capacity to host the dimensions of God. So every time she begins to worship, if she is accurate with God, what she creates in the spirit is a system of spiritual resonance. And on the strength of, this, of that resonance, everybody in that service is brought to a plane in the spirit where God can make contact with them. Even the ones that were weak and the ones that were strong. This now becomes an economy that is beyond the level of excitement. So the guy comes for the service, he doesn't even know whether God wants to use him. But the moment the lady begins to sing, his eyes open and he begins to see a vision. Now, somebody else may be in the service having no discernment because he or she doesn't know the song the lady is singing. It does not resonate with his emotion. So he feels that the worship was weak. Meanwhile, when that lady was singing, what the spirit ran was responding to was the energy that was coming from her. And on the strength of that energy, she creates a resonance. And many people enter into spiritual possibilities. But because that song is not a song that is sang in Zaria, you don't know the song, so you think the worship was not strong. You may even sit down and be doing like this. And then somebody else comes, and then he sings a song that all of us know. And that song can easily find the frequency of our emotion. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Then everybody begins. <laughs> and then you say, oh my God, oh my God. Then the spirit comes into the service. And then when the spirit begins to, che- begins to check, the guy who sang the song you did not know resonated, created a resonance in the spirit. And many people will leave that service. They will think it's the impartation of the man of God. Meanwhile, that lady brought them to the realm of Mahanai. And as they leave that service, they discover they begin to walk in word of knowledge. They pray for the sick, the sick is healed. They may never even trace it to her in their lives. But the one that sang and they were excited, they thought something happened. Their emotions were only stirred. So men may judge by what they felt. But when the spirit comes to judge, he judges on the degree of consistency with ordination. The man of God may even come to preach that day and talk Bible from his head. But the only lady that struck a chord in the spirit is the lady that was able to create Mahanai. 
So when spirits judge, they judge you based on the degree to which you have the ability to bring the will of God on the scene. And the man that brings the will of God on the scene is the man that is useful in the hand of God. So, the Lord spoke to Moses. And he told Moses to begin to judge and to rate men by the system of the shekels of the sanctuary. And then he began to rate men by their abilities. In Leviticus 27, he said, if a man is between the ages of 20 to 60, let him be worth 50 shekels according to the rating of the shekels of the sanctuary. If a woman is between the age of 20 to 60, let her be worth 30 shekels. If a man is between the ages of 5 to 20, let that man be worth 10 shekels. If a woman is between the ages like that, and he outlined all of that. Why was that written like that? Because their service to God was on the strength of the ability that God gave them. And in their dispensation, ability was a natural reality. So the man had, the, had more ability to bring the will of God to pass. Maybe it was a time of war. But when our dispensation came, Paul now began to show us a new rating. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul began to tell us a rating that was not captured in the Old Testament. It became according to the intentions of your heart. To what degree does your heart, your intentions, your motivation align with the will of God? So Paul is now telling you, it's not about what you can do. He said, when God comes to reveal that which is in the heart of man, then he will reward every man according to his works. So reward now was not on the basis of the intensity or magnitude of your work, but according to what was in your heart. So God had migrated from physical manifestation to intrinsic transformational manifestation. So what you do before a spirit judges it, it checks your heart. And this is where sanctification becomes the deciding factor. But unfortunately, we are doing so much, there are few that are aligned. We know a lot of Bible, but God is not here. We quote a lot of scripture, God is not here. This is where our greatest crisis is. He said, a man will purge himself. I thought it was God that will purge a man. Why would God ask me to purge myself? Can I purge myself? What was Paul talking about? He shifts you to the next layer. That sanctification is a function of yieldedness. I'm building something. In the next 20 minutes, I may shift, I may shift gear. But I needed to establish this little, little foundation so that Everybody will hear something. And if you go home, you will know. You can't deny it. When we talk sanctification, there are two layers. You separate from the world. And then you separate unto the Lord. A man separates from the world when he decides to rebel against sin and ask the Lord to become the defining factor of his life. But the moment you separate from the world, the only way to separate unto God is to yield to Him. When you yield to God, then God begins to redefine the texture of your soul. The texture of your soul cannot be touched because you studied the Bible, unfortunately. The texture of your soul cannot be touched because you prayed. And I will show you this from the scriptures. So you will know why you speak in tongues for five hours. And then you finish a retreat of 10 days, you find yourself struggling with lust. You know, they teach us the things the fathers did. If they were to tell us their story some of the times, it will help us more. They tell you it's prayer and fasting. You have been praying and fasting for three years, but you are still bound by what you are doing. They tell you it's giving. You have been giving, but you are still epileptic in the hand of the devil. So you look, you look at your life, you are frustrated. You don't know what to do anymore. You allowed yourself for six months. You say, I will fast until God visits. And you fasted for three months. The day that fasting ended, the next day, the devil just sends that girl that has not spoken to you for two years. And she shows up and says, hmm, Titus, 
So you like this, you have forgotten me. And then you discover that your six months fasting have no texture to withstand an admiration from a lady you've not seen for two years. These are the crises most of us go through in the secret. You pray in tongues every day for three hours. And then after you have run that schedule faithfully for three months, you felt that, ah, I have statue, I have statue. And then you came out of the hostel and the first person you saw dressed in a very terrible fashion. And then instantly your, your soul alignment scatters. Now say, ah, this thing will be prayer again. <laughs> you don't know who to talk to. Because every other person is forming as if he's doing it well. Meanwhile, brother. <laughs> you see? Pray you. You see, oh boy. Hey, I wish I was like this. You came for service. You saw the lady praying and crying. You say, Jesus, why not bless me with this body? You didn't know that that girl is repenting from... She just came from immorality. So if you receive that body, you'll be in trouble. <laughs> oh my God! I told them in UN, don't pray to receive another man's body. You don't know what the person is saying. Talk to God to furnish body in your heart. You saw the person, oh Lord, and then you say, cry. This sister loves the Lord, loves God. Love is not crying, no. Love is obedience. Yieldedness is the cure of human affliction. But many are not yielded. The cure. This is not a matter of open this scripture, open this verse, open this verse. Open, no, no. It's yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. I will teach you how the Holy Ghost does it. And then we'll begin to pray. That's when I will show you the secret of the patriarchs. The secret of their lives. Why these men were able to receive a good report. Remember, it was not men reading their citation. It was God that read their citations from heaven. And God will bear witness that a man pleased him. God will bear witness that a man was faithful in all of his house. God will bear witness. What if God were to speak about you in the public? If God wants to speak about me now, say, please say it in the bedroom first. Because many times when God came to speak, they were heavy rebukes. But this man, God spoke about them in the open theater of human existence, of all generations. And he said, this one was faithful. This one was, was honorable. He said, this one feared me. This one was obedient. What, what did they know? What did they know? What did they do that we are not doing? Remember, all of us are praying. Remember, all of us are studying the word of God. What then is that factor that distinguishes us? All of us attend great meetings. We go for revival meetings. We also minister in revival meetings. From the moment we say, Jesus, everywhere is on fire. But what is the crisis? The guy comes to worship God with a trumpet. Everybody is on the floor. Everybody is weeping. Himself is weeping. But he leaves that place. His heart is decaying. Texture. What? How does God deal with the matter of texture? When a man begins to yield to God, then God brings a syllabus. It's called the transformational syllabus. And that's what I will share with us briefly this evening. Then we'll pray. I told you, I want us to pray. And the kind of prayer we are praying today is not a prayer of encounter. It's not a prayer of manifestation. It's not a prayer of blessings. It's a prayer of becoming. So that the plagues that are rooted in our hearts will be uprooted. A point came in my life, I pursued all the men of God I revered, and I made sure they laid hands on me. But I still had crisis. And now discovered that, okay, there is a place of impartation, but transformation is not one of it. I had periodic prayer sessions. I prayed periodically. But things were still wrong in my soul. I now discovered that prayer alone was not a factor. I studied scriptures, I crammed scriptures, I could quote, memorize them. But there was still crisis here. And I now discovered the word of God, reciting it, is not a cure in this matter. That was when I discovered that the only cure was the presence of the Holy Spirit. And only men who are yielded 
can walk into that presence. That's where human affliction is removed. And how does the Holy Ghost take men to his presence? These are the things that we need to know. If you look at the life of the patriarchs, they began their journey with God with encounters. It's not this one we come, we receive two, three words of knowledge, and then we, we talk about it for five years. No. It's not this one we hear a voice, and we talk about it for six months. These men had no scripture they were reading. Every time God spoke to them, it was God talking to them directly. So the Rema word you receive once in a while, that was what they were living by every day of their lives. The visions you see once in a while, that was what they had continuously. Can you imagine a man like Noah? God will reveal so much to him that the whole dimension of the ark he was supposed to build. He had all the dimension, the woods, the length, the breadth. Such level of continuous and progressive vision in order to define the essence of his life. Where you are going with God today, how many visions have you received? Maybe God spoke to you five years ago that you'll be an apostle. And since then, God, God has not appeared to you. That's what you are working with. Then this is a man that God told him the beginning to the end of his life. The ark was what defines his relevance in eternity. He had all the dimension from the beginning to the end. You imagine a man like Moses met God with a, by encounter. He began with encounter. And then he will, God will give him a narrative of everything that will happen. And every time Moses doesn't understand, all he needs to do is to turn back and go to God. And God will say, go and do this. People were discussing with God every day. But those were not the things that define who they were. Because when God came to speak about them, He never spoke about their manifestation. He never spoke about their encounters. He never spoke about their visions. Go and read Hebrews chapter 11. When the Bible was speaking concerning Abel, the Bible said He gave, He offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. When He spoke about Noah, He said, When God spake, Noah moved with fear and built the ark. He never spoke about the technocracy, the mastery, the intelligence in creating the ark. Imagine we now, if I come to this service and I do like this, big, 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 I begin to give word of knowledge. I do like this, these people go down. You will see the beauty and the excellence in the administration of the gift of God. So when the guy was building the ark, that was the beauty in administering the gift of God. Because in his day, the zenith of the move of God was the building of that ark. So he built it with the best architectural intelligence. It's just the way you flow in word of knowledge today and it's beautiful. You move in the power of God, it's beautiful. But when God came, he didn't speak about the skill in building the ark. What God emphasized that brought witness to his life was his reverence for God. When God spoke about Abraham, Abraham entered the city that he was going to by word of knowledge. No marks given to him. No direction. He walked with the Lord until he found that city. So every day in Abraham's life was continuous and progressive word of knowledge. But God didn't speak about the word of knowledge. It was Abraham's obedience that brought him relevance with God. This is why I told you when spirits come to check and evaluate, what do they look at? If you were Noah, you would think God is so impressed because you created an act that fitted the dimensions. But when God came, it was God was looking at reverence in his heart. How did Noah get there? The life of Noah became a revelation of what accurate service we mean for eternity. So till tomorrow, any man that serves God without reverence cannot pass the test of the immortals. The reason they are called patriarchs is not because they came first. Because if it's because they came first, Adam's name would have been the first there. But it was not about who came first. It was about the pathways in the spirit that they pioneered on account of their work with God. So these guys pioneered different dimensions that became portals through which you and I will walk into. So today, this preaching and preaching, no matter how intelligent it sounds, even if I open all the scripture, it will not move a spirit until I do it with reverence. So in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 28, it said we should serve God with what? We should present our service through reverence. Fear, trembling. That's what spirits judge. 
service without reverence will never pass any test. How did this man get into that level of knowledge? The Bible will speak concerning a man. And he will be pointing parameters that God considers. Are those parameters in your life? How did they know these things? How did they know it? If we know how they know it, I will begin to walk our lives like that. You may discover that, yes, word of knowledge may be sharp in your life. But what will be heavy in your life will be fear. So when you are moving in word of knowledge and people are clapping, you are telling God, have mercy. Lord, am I right? Lord, show mercy. Lord, show mercy. So you are doing what you are doing with fear and trembling. People are looking at the excellence and the beauty. But you know that what defines your stand with God is that reverence that has been wired into your spirit. You may be ministering in songs and people are falling, things are happening. And they are saying, this guy is anointed. But you know that your greatest molecule is the heart of love. So every time you go there, all you are doing, you are just loving the Lord. You don't know how people get to fall down. You, you were just loving the Lord. Somebody may look at you and think it's the kind of song you are singing. Or it's the way you tweak your voice. And then the person begins to tweak his voice like that. Or is worshipping God and doing the same gesticulation that you do. But the more he does it, the more people are looking like this. Meanwhile, you, you have understood that that parameter that the Spirit of God alights upon is your heart for him. So every time you carry the microphone, you let loose. You just pour yourself onto the Lord. But how you got to know that yourself will not understand. How? It is transformational Bible study. You may come, you are sharing the word of God and people are looking at, how does this guy know these scriptures? How does he open these truths? How does he do this thing? How? How? They think it's by the concordance and the Bible apps that you have. So they come to your house and collect all the Bible apps you have. They even ask you, when do you read the Bible? You say, okay, well, because there is noise, I'm a busy person. I wake up by 1 a.m. They begin to read by 1 a.m. So when they wake up by 1 a.m., they sleep till 4 a.m. And they say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Meanwhile, every time you stand there, what happens to you is that there is a portal that opens in your spirit. And then you flow by inspiration. And that inspiration does not flow through you just because you came to share the Bible. That inspiration flows through you because there are definite demands that the Lord has on your life. The more you keep it, the more that inspiration is open. So they may not know that for you, you have made a covenant with your eyes. Why will you look upon the virgins? So, so long as you don't look upon the virgins, every time you carry the scripture, it opens like a portal. The guy doesn't know that the secret is not because you study. Now, it is very important to study. What I'm teaching you is not a bit to violate principles. Principles are the heaviest molecules of human work with God. But until his principle is, is breathed upon by the life of the spirit, it becomes a body. You stand there because your eyes cannot look upon the virgin. So the law of your life is a fear of God. Somebody else, the law of his life is his quickness to respond to God. The moment God speaks, he takes off with trembling. So every time God speaks, he may... I heard the story about Benson Dahosa. He was in, in the U.S. the first time he traveled. Living in a, a very tight place in Benin. And then he was with Tiel Osborne and some other ministers. And somebody called him and said, Take, he took him to three locations and told him to pick any house he wanted. That they will allow him to pay for a long period of time. He won't even feed it. And then he picked the best. He said when they took him to the first place, he said, we'll pick this house. The man said, wait first. See the second one. When he came to the second one, I said, I'm not picking the first one again. I'm picking this one. The man said, wait first. He took him to the third location. I said, I'm picking this one. The man said, okay, this is better. And then he picked the house. And that night when he went to sleep, God said, if you take that house, I will kill you. Leave now. He went around 2 a.m. in the morning and woke the man up and said, I want to go. He said, why? He said, God, we kill me. He said, ah, are you okay? He said, I want to leave now. The man said, what's wrong with you? How about the house? He said, God said, I shouldn't take it. What do you mean? Are you all right? He said, I am going now. He went and woke his wife. They argued till 5 a.m. in the morning. The wife said, she's not going anywhere. They... <laughs> The man left his wife in the U.S., carried his bag, went to the airport. This woman stayed back. And he returned to Nigeria. So you see him, you may think faith for him is because he meditates on scripture. All of us, we meditate on scripture. But there is something God looks at in his life. His quickness to respond in obedience. 
So you may do every routine that best in the Daosa does, but you will never see his manifestation. That's why I told you it's not about prayer. Prayer is part of it. It's not about study. Study is part of it. But there are things that the Holy Ghost weaves into your soul that becomes the defining parameter of your destiny. For many, is the fear of God. The day the fear of God dies, you will keep doing what you are doing, but you have no result. That's why when God judges, He doesn't judge the result. He judges that thing that you have with Him. Because that thing you have with Him is what defines you. But this is what the Lord don't have. And that's why our texture dies. The guy begins ministry with fear. He doesn't move until God speaks. But now, when He speaks, 50,000 people hear Him. So He's now saying, ah, there's need for excellence in ministry. That is very correct. But the day excellence takes the position of the fear of God, that was the fulcrum that defined your work with God, that day, the texture is lost. And this is the crisis of many believers. The guy starts ministry. God tells him, pray in the night. Your key is night prayer. He was faithful to it until God began to announce him. And then it became difficult. Because he went to preach, he had five invitations. He preached, he came back, he was tired. So that obedience was lost. He doesn't know that the moment the obedience was lost, even the utterance he has that he thought was a killer, that utterance will die. The guy goes to a point and then he loses the things that define his work with God. The patriarchs, their work with God was based on that parameter that the Holy Ghost revealed to them in the days of dealing. And even until they became old, it was their defining moment. So the Bible will speak concerning Enoch. He said the time when it was right for him to be taken, he spake and he said, I please God. That thing that he had with God, he didn't lose it until he was old. But if we look at our life today, we have truncated what we began with God that was our greatest security. That's why the church in Ephesus had so many manifestations. But when Jesus came, he said, I have something against you. Go back to your first love. What is that thing that defined your work with God that now because of fame, because of influence, you are beginning to lose it? That is why the texture of your Christianity will be watered down. The more you grow with God, the lighter you will become. The more you grow with God, the weaker you will become. And men become mighty. Men that demons could not walk around their corridor when they were two years in the Lord. Now they are 30 years in the Lord and demons dwell on their inside. What is the difference? Once upon a time, the devil dreaded them. If they were somewhere praying, the devil would not come there. But now, even while praying, the devil comes to reveal thoughts to their heart. The devil fights them in the place of prayer. What has gone wrong? They have lost that molek. And the only way the Holy Ghost brings us to that point where we walk perpetually in those dimensions, it is by the technology of yieldedness. It's a teaching sila that only the Holy Ghost knows to teach. A man can show you scripture. A man can bring you revelation. But that dealing of God upon your life, it is your responsibility to preserve it. When the Bible said, if we purge ourselves, what the Bible was telling us is not to wash yourself of sin. It is the blood of Jesus that washes you of sin. What the Bible was saying, when you purge yourself, is your effort and consistent you deadness to that dictate of the Holy Spirit that was the defining factor of your life and destiny. If you have lost it, then you have altered the protocol of transformation and your texture will be weak. Even if you are made of gold, you will no longer be relevant. Because every time you come to speak, the reason you are able to bring heaven on the scene is not because you were intelligent. It's not because you were skilled. It's not because you were gifted. All of this are a part of it. But the thing that God looks upon is that thing that he built into your soul. What is it God built in your soul that you are losing? For Abraham, I told you, God began with them through encounters. But their life did not continue with encounter. Their lives continue with obedience. We will begin with obedience and then we turn into encounter and we destroy obedience. That is why we become light feathered. You come to church today, you say, Lord, speak. How many people have seen? 50 people have seen. They have seen a vision. They have seen an angel. They call you, they say, I was praying. Light appeared from the wall and stood and looked at me. Ah, my hand began to burn. My hand, my hand. And that my hand began to burn becomes what is the greatest concern of his life. Meanwhile, when he began with God and God was raising him, his concern was fear. He will never move when God speaks. And even if he has moved, if God speaks, he stops. That guy can go back publicly and apologize to everybody because he had the fear of God. But now, Kai, the Holy Ghost said, go back and tell that brother, he said, is it not that guy that, uh, that guy serves me now? How can I apologize? I'm the president. God is not dealing with you as a president. He's dealing with you as a servant. 
that is boy, that is son that he has always worked with. So when Jesus came to Nicodemus, he didn't bother whether he was a Pharisee. He didn't bother whether he was a member of the Sanhedrin. All Jesus bothered about was he is a man. So God will always continue with you like that. How do we purge ourselves by yielding? Let me tell you the story of Abraham in five minutes and then I'll round up. The Bible said God had appeared to Abraham in the hall of the Chaldees and had given him all the commandment about his life. You know, the way God spoke to these men, sometimes when I look at it, I wonder how will God speak to a man and tell him everything to the end and all the promises of his, of his life, God reveals all of them to him. God spoke to Abraham, told him what to do, and then told him what he will do for him. All the blessings that God wanted to give Abraham, he narrated all of them to him before he started. Imagine if God came to tell you today that uh, if you walk with me, a point will come when I will make you become the man that chooses the American president. If you walk with me, every year, the least you will have is one billion. Maybe God also understands that our generation have become too fleshly. We pursue him for what we can gain. So if he told us that, it will become a distraction. He gave Abraham all the promises. Leave your father's house. No, leave your nation, leave your kindred, leave your father's house. And I will bless you. In blessings, I will bless you. He said, all the generations of the earth shall be blessed. He said, they that curse you shall be caught. Imagine the immunity that came with it. And then after God told him everything he wanted to do for him, God now introduced the code of obedience. And God began to carry him. God began to carry him. So what we bring Abraham into that level of relevance was his continuous followership of that code that God gave to him. I call it the code of the supernatural. And when I say supernatural, I'm not talking about manifestation. I'm talking about accuracy with God. Manifestation, part of it. The approval of God, part of it. So for Abraham's life until he was old and stricken in age, he followed that code. He followed that code. Apostle will teach us and say, when God spoke to Abraham and gave him the whole promises and Abraham was willing to obey, he said God carried him. And Abraham walked with God and went to seek him. And when he went to Sikkim, he passed through Sikkim to Moreh. And from Moreh, he went to Ai. And from Ai, he went to Bethel. He said, what is Sikkim? The word Sikkim means shoulder. That's where you carry burden. Those days, they don't carry load on the head. They carry it on the shoulder. And then the word Moreh means teacher. That means the Holy Ghost teaches by body. That's what I want to explain to us this night. And it's the story of Abraham. All his life, everything he learned from the Holy Spirit, he learned by experience. So when you go to the Bible and you read about obeying God, and then you come out of the room, you now go to your lecture hall, the Holy Ghost now say, that way 200 naira you have, give it to Brother Austin. If you don't obey it, the Bible you read, you didn't understand it. You may understand the English language, but you don't understand the essence. So you read... To obey is better than sacrifice. To hack it than the fat of rams. And then you carry it, you came for prayer meeting. And when you were leading prayer, you say, To obey is better than sacrifice. And then people were doing like this. And then you left. <laughs> and then when you went to him, the Holy Ghost gave an instruction. And then you couldn't obey. You didn't know that scripture, even though you quoted it and power moved. So what will happen to you is that you will go to eternity and you will be weak. You will be small. With all your manifestation. That's what Jesus meant when he said, away from me. There's manifestation, but there's no texture. Because we don't learn the ways of the Spirit. We don't yield to the Holy Spirit. And we don't follow Him. The Scriptures are sweet until there is need to obey. The Scriptures are beautiful until it begins to play out in our lives. We stay at the level of the beauty of Scripture. That's why we are shallow. We don't allow the scripture to be walked into us when the Holy Ghost comes. Because every time a man ventures out to learn about the spirit, that spirit will show up if it's consistent. But when that spirit shows up, will you be yielded? That's what will define who you are. The texture of your work with God is not a function of how much you know. The texture of your work with God is not a function of how much you can do. The texture of your work is how much you have become on account of your yieldedness. For Abraham, 
he became a ranking personality because he went through Sikkim and More. And when he, uh, uh, when he finished that syllable, his life changed from AI to Betel. AI is a pile of stone. There was no order. That's why you come for meeting, you see the guy. There is so much gift of the spirit, but you can't find the life of God. That's an AI man. He didn't pass through Sikkim and More. You come, you see things happen, but that's an AI personality. If that man goes through the burden technology of the Holy Ghost's doctrine, a point will come when he will become the house of God. So every time that man speaks, heaven backs him up. And it is God himself that will bear witness for that man. It is no longer about what he knows anymore. It's about the spirit that he can witness to. His life becomes a theater through which God can be seen. Every time we move in the gift of the spirit, the idea is not to show what we can do. The idea is because there is a God in the spirit realm that wants to manifest among men. And if you manifest the gift apart from the essence of that God, you have wasted God's time. Because God does not invest in men to make a show. God invests in men because there is a purpose that he wants to reveal. The eternal purpose of God is for Jesus to become the center and circumference of human existence. So when you flow a word of knowledge, how much do people become like God? When you preach your intelligent doctrine, what does it do to the heart of the men that hear you? Peter spake and the Bible said they were caught in their heart. I thought he was speaking Aramaic. Why did they not hear him in their head and they were caught in their heart? Because he was talking God. He was not talking the doctrine. Brothers and sisters, I came this evening to call us into yieldedness. That is the only way we can become vessels unto honor. We are not honorable because of our hairstyle. We are not honorable because of the suit we wear. We are not honorable because of the impression we successfully create before men. We are honorable because the spirit that we represent says so. And that spirit will only speak if we have truly become yielded to him. The Christianity we practice today is a Christianity of rebellious people. The rebellious people. We know how to make it happen without the Holy Spirit. We know how to make it work without the Holy Spirit. And that's the difference between our work with God and the work of the fathers. The fathers, even though they have so much ability, they will never move. Why will David, who is a king, need to consult the urine and the tumim before he makes a move? It was not about his strength. It was about the will and the mind of the father. That is how these guys were trained. The Holy Ghost could count on them at every time of their lives. Because those days, they waited on God until God broke them. Nowadays, we pray until God begins to give instruction. The guy says he will do everything for God. He's going for the prayer meeting every day. Until God says, leave that sister. And then prayer meeting ends. He wants to serve God and do everything. Until God says, leave Zaria and go back to your village. Because the gospel they taught him is a gospel that we have to be in Lagos and prosper. There is nothing wrong with prosperity. But if we teach prosperity outside of the dictates of ordination, it will become witchcraft. Because there is no prosperity you can teach John the Baptist. The only way he can reveal the Messiah is to live in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth. If you make John the Baptist live in the palace, you have excused him from his ordination. So prosperity cannot infringe on the peculiarity of God's dealing upon your life. That is why even though we teach on the altar, the syllables that the Holy Ghost teaches us by body is the most important syllable of our life. This is where most of us violate God. This is where most of us violate our calling. This is where most of us violate our ordination. And we don't know why we don't amount to much with God. We know everything in our head. We practice everything we were taught. But we don't follow the voice of the Holy Spirit. We don't follow the whispers of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost may not say anything contrary to what you are taught. But what the Holy Ghost tells you is the compass of your destiny. The Bible said Abraham went through Sikkim and he came to Moreh. Did you notice that after Abraham was done, the first thing Abraham learned from that school was not how to prosper. The first thing Abraham learned from that school was the system of altars. Because in, 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 in Genesis chapter 12, from verse 7, the Bible said, The moment he left Sikkim and Moreh, he said he built an altar to the Lord that appeared to him. So for Abraham's life, the secret of his greatness was the things he learned in the days of Dini. And the first thing Abraham showed you and I that he learned was not the wisdom of prosperity. It was not the excellence of ministry. It was not the strategy of making it in life. It was the wisdom of authors. And that was where Abraham dwelled. You cannot understand the story of Abraham until you have understood the altars that were littered in his path of, of, of pilgrimage. Abraham was a man of altars. And that was what even preserved his heritage forever. Jacob would have violated everything Abraham labored for in his life. Except that Abraham was able to learn the syllables of altar when he was taught in Sikkim. It was that altar that he planted 
that became the thing that rescued his posterity. Many of us, the Holy Ghost whispers, but we violate it. Everything we have been taught is correct. We will keep doing them. But there is one thing we need to add in order for our work with God to have texture. If not, the day we come, you will think you love God until you begin to receive seeds of five million. And they come in very periodic frequencies. That's when you think that ministry is excellence. There is excellence in ministry, but ministry is not excellence. Ministry is the life of the Spirit flowing out through a man. And the only way that life can flow out through you is the degree to which you plug to that spirit. Until the money begins to come, until the fame begins to come, that's when you will think ministry is about making people know that you have something. So you show up somewhere. God said, do this. Hey. No. The governor is here today. The guy came throughout the night. There was one song the Holy Ghost was, speak, was singing. Take me deeper. But every time he sings that song, he doesn't see power. Now he came for a meeting where the governor is around. And he, he no, something needs to happen. The Holy Ghost is singing that song in his heart. But Kai, Kai, ministry now is about what people think. Did you not read the life of Saul? He said, when you were small in your own eyes, did I not make you big? So what even makes people honor you so much? It's not even how much you can do. I've seen great men of God came for meetings. They, they, the people cheered and ran and then they came and said, God loves you. I just came to tell you the Lord loves you. And then when they left, people were still excited. Ah! Is this all this man came from America to tell us? They chartered a jet, brought you from America and then you come, you say, oh, you know, the Lord loves you um, and you will still honor them because honor is a spirit. This man knows how it works. So they don't care about what you have to say. The day Saul began to care about what the people said, he lost it. The guy is teaching 10 people. Power is moving. He goes somewhere. There are 50,000 people for the first time. And the Holy Ghost says, calm down. He looks around. He sees 10 big pastors in that city. Those are 10 big invitations. He has been trusting God for 3 years for breakthrough. How can God set his stage now? I want to humble him. He doesn't know that God is more interested in becoming than in manifestation. Because it is your texture that will travel with you to eternity. It is not the manifestations. The manifestation will be rewarded based on your texture. That's why he said when the counsel of the heart of man is revealed, that is when God is permitted to reward. If the counsel of your heart is not revealed, there is no reward for you. And many may not even be known and applauded in time, but in eternity they will be captains of thousands. I want to tell us tonight that every one of us have something the Holy Ghost is upon in our soul. We are all a project that God is working on. We go for those big meetings, we come back, that project is constant. We catch fire, we burn for months. The fire goes down, we catch other fire. The project is constant. That means what God wants to ride upon to make a difference in our lives is that project that is in our lives. For Abel, it was an excellent offering. For Noah, it was the fear of the Lord. For Abraham, it was quick obedience. For Moses, it was departure from Egypt. The Bible said he, he, he left the pledges of Egypt and chose to suffer affliction with God's people. What is the project God is running in your life that you are rebellious to? You hear quick messages, sound messages, intelligent messages. You have encounters, you have impartations. But what is that project? Did you not notice that that is the most constant thing in your life? Because that's what the Holy Ghost is sitting on. For your destiny to open that particular dimension of God. That thing God is working on in your life to manifest. It only runs on the economy of that project that God is running. Some of us is humility that is the key to our breakthrough. We will apply these principles, they will work. But until God is able to break us, nothing will work. So for 10 years, God has been dealing with pride. 10 years! You were nothing, God was talking pride. Now you are grown, God is still talking pride. 10 years! The Holy Ghost is constant. You have seen 10 angels. You have seen 15 angels. You have had encounters. Your legs, your teeth are burned. You were praying, even your teeth was on fire. 
but the Holy Ghost is constant on pride. That one he will not shift ground. The reason is because he wants to make you. That's how that's what God means when he's committed to a man. Some of us is lying this tongue for five years. Every time you violate it, the Holy Ghost must remind you. That's the only time where you lose your peace. It's a statement that that is the fork room that will open your life. Some of us is lack of fear. The reverence of God is no longer there. God wants to teach you tonight. And this teaching, as you step out of this meeting, it will become intense. Because that beacon of light that is in your spirit that the devil is, is trying to press down, the Holy Ghost will come upon it again. And as you leave, you will find the Holy Ghost become strong on that stuff. Forget this doctrine of every time you have a forgiveness, God will forgive you. There is nothing wrong with it. It is correct. Because we are forgiven in Christ. But our relevance in the kingdom is not based on forgiveness. Our relevance in the kingdom is based on our degree of yieldedness to become. God will forgive you because he doesn't want to violate his fellowship with you anymore. But what you will become is what will determine who you will be in eternity. And remember, God judges us and looks at us and relates with us more because of eternity. It's not because God doesn't want you to be big in time. It is his pleasure to bless you to be mighty. But the wise understand that everything God gives them in time is a resource for relevance in eternity. I want us to pray the next five minutes. I came here to bring us a quick reminder. I didn't know what the Holy Ghost did to your heart to make you bring people to a point where they will be reminded that there is a need to be purged. There is a need to come to the Lord again. We have the revival meetings, we have the power meetings, we have the prosperity conferences, but there is a need to be purged again. I don't know why God dropped that to your heart, but the key to purging is your yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost is the only one that knows where He will take you to that your pride will be chiseled. The Holy Ghost is the only one that knows where he will take you to, that your tongue will be sanctified. The Holy Ghost is the only one that knows where he will take you to, that your heart will be broken and modified to be able to host his dimension. These ones are not teaching that men can bring. And that's why when you hear, it's you, when you go out there that the Holy Ghost begins to walk with you. We may teach you in the congregation, but the Holy Ghost teaches you from your heart. So you can be with your friend and the Holy Ghost is talking. You can be with your classmates, the Holy Ghost is talking. It is your degree of yieldedness that will define who you will become. You want to be a vessel of honor, you must be a yielded vessel. Because until you are yielded, you cannot be sanctified. The Holy Ghost will only walk on you to the degree of your yieldedness. Can we bow our heads and pray? next two minutes, talk to the Lord quickly. I know most of you are called of God. Most of you have, you sense the calling of God upon your life. I know. I know most of you know a lot of things. There's nothing. Zaria is a ground of revelation. Zaria is a ground of power. It's a ground of manifestation. So when you come to a place like this, you don't labor to do so much. Even the atmosphere can create a lot of things if you take advantage of it. But where are the men that have texture? Where are the men that will rise, that spirits can bank on? Where are the men that God can come and say this one fear me, this one love me, this one obey me? Where are those men? Those are the men that God commits eternal, eternal responsibilities to. You know the areas where you have been rebellious? Can you talk to the Lord about it? Can you drop it at the feet of the master? Is it your tongue? Is it your thoughts? Tell the Holy Ghost, if you will take me through second, I will follow you. Yes. 
Those places I've run away from, I will follow you there now. I will follow you. Those places it carries you to that you say, no, it's too hard. That's where transformation is. He said, if you go through the fire, you will not be burned. So to know faithfulness, you have to journey with him through fire. You go through the waters, you will not be drowned. Talk to him now. Tell him, commit yourself, commit those areas to him. Commit it to him, commit it to the Lord. This is not that service where we jump. This is that service where we, we are sober. We check again, we check, we check, we check. And you don't have to be emotional about it. You have to be deliberate about it. Principles are very important. But spirit life makes the difference. So that your skill does not ultimately become a waste. So that your giftings does not ultimately become a waste. So that your graces does not ultimately become a waste and the investment of God in your life does not become a waste in eternity that God will look upon you and say well done my faithful servant you need to yield to the Holy Spirit you need to yield to the Holy Spirit talk to him talk to him be deliberate be deliberate make commitments spirits begin to walk from the point of commitment talk to the Lord now talk to the Lord I know some of us are leaders, some of us are ministers, some of us already own and run ministries for God. But what is the project of God on your life? To what degree are you committed? Don't just focus on growing the ministry. Watch jealously that dealing of God on your life. Because at every level there's a layer of that dealing. He said, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Therein. God may be dealing with fear. There's a level of fame and stardom you enter. It will become stronger. God may be dealing with pride. There's a level of fame and stardom. God will never leave that syllabus. That project is an eternal project. For Abraham, he continued until he was old and stricken in age. Old and stricken in age. That's why when God wants to talk about the story of a man, he doesn't narrate his life, his life. He picks that project of his life. That project that was the dealing of his life. If God touches it, every other part of that man resonates from that frequency. So for Abel, the moment he called offering, he had spoken the story of Abel's life. For Noah, the moment he called reverence, he has told the story of his life. For Abraham, the moment he called obedience, he had told the story of Abraham's life. What is that thing God will mention about your life that will represent the story of your life? What is it? Is it the fear of God? Is it prompt obedience? Is it humility of the spirit? Is it yieldedness to the spirit? For Moses, God mentioned faithfulness. And faithfulness represented the story of Moses' life. Faithfulness. He said he was faithful in all of the house of God. What is that word that defines you? Jesus said on that day, He will give every man a new name that no man knew it. It's a function of the factor that defines your life. Manifestations are important. We need it to conquer our world. But who we are in the spirit is an intimate reality with God. What did God mention that will define your life? What defines your life? What defines your life? What is that spiritual substance that defines your life? Until you have it, you don't have a life. You only have breath on your nose. It was awesome. Glory to Jesus. You see, God has done so much already. From what the Lord has done, if we close this service now, the purpose has been achieved. Purpose has been achieved. Such a mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God. Great grace, servants of God. You know, I have the witness in my spirit to 
begin the service with an impartation of God's Spirit. And how beautiful and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in Ammon. The man of God has picked it and he has made my job easy. I will just share the word of the Lord and then I'll sneak and be on my way to my body. <laughs> Glory to God. This morning we are going to try to establish the premise, the premise upon which the kingdom of God is domesticated. The premise upon which sons and daughters of order will be beckoned by the Holy Spirit to come into a place of service in order to provide the needed kind of supply that the Spirit of God is willing to have in this dispensation. The moves of God are dispensational. Different, different dispensations have different supplies and they have different demands in the Spirit. It would be a shame for a dispensation to be opened and there are no men, there are no sons of order who are willing to pay the requisite sacrifice in order to bring to bear the purpose of God for their dispensation. You know, Paul is a man of understanding. And he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, he said, according as it is written, he said, they believe and have spoken. We also, having the same spirit of faith, we believe and therefore we speak. In the nutshell, what Paul was trying to establish is that the elders and the fathers, the patriarchs, have played their own part. We are not going to wait for them to come again. This is our time. And the very spirit that enabled them to carry out the assignments that they carried out for God is the very spirit that is at work in us. And we are willing to rise up to the responsibility of doing what our generation, our civilization and our dispensation demands of us. In the days of Abraham, Abraham rose up and fulfilled his own quota. In the days of Elijah, he rose up and fulfilled his own quota. This is the day of Paul and I will fulfill my own quota. That was the scripture that was released there. Abraham will not show up again. Peter doesn't need to show up. This day is your day. And according as it is written, they believe and have spoken. We also, having the same spirit of faith, we believe and therefore we speak. You see, you go to meetings, you go to places, and then people keep calling on the names of patriarchs. They keep invoking the spirits of patriarchs to come on the scene. God does not operate like that. There are very peculiar cases where God had to unleash the spirit of patriarchs. And the reason for which God does that is because those responsibilities are tied specifically to those patriarchs according to the counsel of God before the foundations of the world. So for instance, in order to prosecute the ministry of Elijah, once and again Elijah had to be invoked to fulfill those mandates that were ported out into different dispensations. So when those dispensations come, the spirit of Elijah will have to man to a man in order to carry out that assignment. But such operations of God are specific operations. In a more boisterous fashion, God operates with people per time. And every generation that emerges on the frontiers, God gives them a measure of the spirit to carry out different assignments that are peculiar to their, their, their generation. That was why Paul said in his own generation he was going to carry out his own mandate. This morning, I want to bring you into an understanding of the fact that the things that God wants to do, the things that God intends to achieve, a quota of it is resting on the shoulders of every one of us. And until we corporately agree together to form that quorum, that corporate ranking that is required to advance that counsel of God, it will not be achieved. So one of the things you'll be doing at the end of this service is to make up your mind to stand in the gap so that you will not be the weakest part of the link. Because the link breaks at the weakest part. And the strength of the, of, of, of the chain is judged from the weakest point. Every one of us is going to be empowered this morning in order to rise up and march together as a corporate army that is willing to extend the frontiers of the kingdom and to lead the banners of Zion. In the worst case scenario, God must be seen as the king and the monarch of Zion. 
and that responsibility is not going to come from heaven it's going to come from earth because men are willing to stand for jesus and i want to tell you this morning that that man that we stand in order to ensure that the banner of zion is floating in enugu state is you it's not babalola it's not patrick Oman. it's you it's you the essence of the gospel is to give you the energy level that is required for you to stand. Nobody who did it was strong. Everybody that did it, did it on account of the supply of grace. It is grace that makes the difference. Women like Captain Kuman were weak. They were very weak women. They were praying. When you look upon them, you know that they are weak people. But by the spirit of grace, Captain Kuma could face the floor for 18 hours speaking in tongues. It's not because she's strong. If you call a, a bouncer to pray in tongues for 30 minutes, he will sleep. Because it's a spiritual interaction. And until spirit supply energy cannot be achieved. Everything God wants us to do is at the level of the spirit. So we must learn how to connect to supplies in the spirit so that our weaknesses can be exchanged for these immortal powers. That is the essence for the teaching of the gospel. And this morning, as we begin to travel through the pages of scriptures, we are going to see a role, a specific role that you will be playing. I will be saying one thing, the Holy Ghost will be telling you another. At different points, you are going to be hearing your own instruction. Because the instruction is not for everybody. Every one of us has something God wants us to hear. And when that point comes, you will pick your own by the Spirit of God. And the moment you catch that instruction, then you are in for a change. Give the Lord a big shout this morning. You see, last night I began to explain to us how that God intends for every one of us to be numbered in Him to carry out specific mandates. And I made us understand that for that possibility to find expression, we must all come back to the altar of obedience. I made us understand that man is a fallen creation. We are fallen beings. And because man is a fallen creation, he cannot operate until that genetic mutation that has taken place in his configuration is reordered. And I told you the only way that mutation can be reordered is when the spirit is supplied. Are we together? In fact, I took time to show you the sequence of that denaturation that took place. And I said, the nature of man suffered corruption. And because the nature of man suffered corruption, he began to see me after the sight of the eyes. And I told you that what you see is what you become. So the Bible called it the lust of the eyes. So you lost after the eyes. You see things that satisfy the serpentine nature. And the more you see that, the more like Satan you become. And I also told you the second the nature of one that took place is the loss of the flesh. You develop appetites that were patterned after the systems of the world. And everywhere you go, your appetites are no longer of the God kind. You see, the appetite of the God kind is the appetite of fellowship. It's an appetite that tries to bring you, suck you into the realm of God. But the moment you fell, fellowship was no longer in view. Everything that you tried to do now was to take you away from God. And that is why if you x-ray your life carefully, you discover most of the things that powers you, most of the things that motivate you to do the things you do. They don't draw you to the presence of God. That is the operation of the falling nature, trying to find expression in you. It is called the lust of the flesh. And I told you the only way that could be achieved is if the spirit is supplied. He brings you back into obedience and suddenly you discover that you begin to have desire to stay in the presence of God. You see, when it began with me, I was in a noisy house. Every time they want to watch movies and they love seasonal movies. So they begin to watch from morning to evening, especially when it's weekend. But suddenly I discovered whenever Nepal sees this light, I become happy. I become happy because for the first time, the sound of the TV will go down and people will now go outside. And then suddenly, there was a civilization brooding in my spirit. I didn't know that God was beginning to tackle the lust of the flesh. So instead of desiring to stay away from God, I began to desire to come into the presence. It is a hunger that is better when the nature that is falling is beginning to find the configuration. If that has not begun, it means that you are still far from the path of spiritual progress. And I told you the third is called the pride of life. 
So you x-ray yourself carefully, you discover you don't do things because of yourself. You don't even do things because of God. You do things because of what others will say. So the very car you are driving is because of the people that will see you. See, the way you even drive the car, the clothes you wear, everything becomes about people. So you are drawn away from God. And I told you, the only way that all of this error could be corrected was to come back to the altar of obedience. And the altar of obedience does not only change you and transform you, the altar of obedience makes you relevant for God to use. And it is when God begins to use you that the supernatural dimension of your being will begin to find expression. You see, men like Moses, they were natural men. He was in Egypt, nobody knew him until he grew and became a man. But when that appetite began to draw him, when he began to draw him, a point came where he was drawn into the presence of God and he stayed there in the wilderness for 40 years. Do you know what it means to leave a palace and suddenly begin to live in the wilderness and you are not complaining? It means something has changed in your mind. You are no longer sleeping on the water bed. Suddenly you are sleeping on the rock. But even on the rock, you love it more than when you were on the water bed. You see, you wake up in the morning and people wash your feet and they attend to you. You don't even have to pick anything. You can't pick a pin. Somebody picks for you. And then suddenly you are in a place where you are now commanding ships. And then you don't feel it. The reason you don't feel it is because there has been a reconfiguration in your mind. And when Moses stayed there for a long time, the point came where that transformation hit his body and his eyes opened. And he beheld and he saw a bush burning and it was not consumed. You see, obedience takes you from naturality to immortality. A point came where the man of God could see the things that were happening. You know, a point comes when you, you, you are given to God until when you come to your room, naturally you begin to hear sounds. You are walking on the street, you see people and then you see something on them. See, that obedience has superimposed in your natural being to an extent that you can literally see beyond your realm. That's when men become supernatural. The Moses that ran away from Egypt will now come back to Pharaoh and challenge Pharaoh to let the people of God go. He was no longer a man. He had become a god. The path from humanity to godness or godhood is the path of obedience. God told him in Exodus chapter 7 verse 1, he said, Behold, I have made you a god unto Pharaoh. He was Pharaoh's subject, but now he has become what? A god unto Pharaoh. These were the points we were trying to emphasize last night. But this morning, I want to shift a bit further. I want to shift forward a bit. So that you will see the picture more graphically. You see, most of us, the gospel we began to hear was, For God so loved the world. That he gave his only people to his son. And whosoever believe in him will not perish for having eternal life. That's the only gospel we heard. And because that was the only gospel we heard, we felt that only God was responsible. Our own is just to receive and enjoy. I want to show you the background story. If you see the background, you know, if you are here when this building was erected, and you see the blocks that went inside, when you are in the room, you will not only be seeing the beauty, you will see the dirty job. If you see the background story, then you will know where you fit in. I want to show you the background story. So that you understand what it means for a banquet. When we speak of banquet. You know, banquet is a, a convergence of kings and his mighty men for feasting. The word in the Hebrew is mishte. Mishte means to feast, to drink and to celebrate. But you see, celebration is the last rudder on the equation. So if you don't know how to turn it onto celebration, you will be excluded. You will talk about it, but you will be excluded. So before we talk about the banquet, let me show you what happens at the background. The background story that you were not told. If you know the background story, you will understand why for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son became necessary. You know, that was not part of the original equation. That gospel you were told was not part of the original equation. That became necessary because of the fall. And then when the fall has been addressed, we go back to the original story. The original story is what you were not told. And that is why for some of you have been Christians for 10 years, but you don't have any fruit. 
You can't point to anybody standing because of you. You can't point to anything happening in the body of Christ because of you. But the apostles served Jesus for three and a half years and they became apostles and they took over their kingdom because God showed them the original story. The story began in the spirit realm. It began in the spirit. You know, today I will just give you a narrative of the Bible. I want to summarize the Bible for you so that if you pick a verse in the Bible, you can see the whole picture. If you pick a verse, you can see the whole picture. The story began in the spirit. You see, if you study the book of Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 1 to 10, you are going to see what happened. It is called the Council of the Godhead. It was a community of the Godhead. They sat together and they began to design creation. They began to say what they wanted to see, what they wanted to happen. And when they were designing it, according to the royal decree of God, he was formulating them as laws, as ordinances, and as precepts. Everything that God said was invoked into the creation and it became a law. It became a pathway that everything that was going to come after we follow. And in that chapter that was designed in heaven, God began from the spirit. And the very reason why God began creation was to derive pleasure from outside of himself. You know, the word God means self-existent one. He doesn't need you to be God, but you need him to be God. As self-existent one, everything that he wants and desires is in him. But God wanted to go on an adventure. And on this adventure, God wanted to embark on. He wanted to create something outside of himself that could give him pleasure. He wanted to see how there was a possibility for something outside of him could give pleasure to him. Because he had existed before existence began. Everything was himself. There was nothing outside of him. So for the first time, probably out of God's own curiosity. You know, sometimes we just sit down and want to do something and see what will happen. You know, we have the nature of God. The reason you just sit down and imagine something, and then you do it. Maybe you sit down and say, this evening, let me go and give myself a treat of fried rice and chicken with very chill bottle of wine. And then you reminisce on it, you reminisce on it, then you just go. When you are taking that fried rice and chicken, and then you are taking the wine, then you find pleasure. You find See, God was existing as an entity of himself. There was nothing outside of him. So for the first time, he imagined, what would it look like if I created something outside of me? What kind of pleasure would I enjoy? That was when God began to embark on the mission. And because God was spirit, he began his project from the spirit realm. It was because of that project that angelic pattern was designed. God created beings in the spirit realm and gave them functions. Every functionary in the spirit realm had specific function that he was going to carry out in order to give God pleasure. Out of this angelic pattern, they were split into three. We had the warfare pattern, we had the mystery and the wisdom pattern, and then we had the worship pattern. All of these patterns were headed by archangels. And of these three archangels, one of them is called Michael, the other is called Gabriel, and the other is called Lucifer. But because at the time God embarked on that spiritual creation, there was no war in heaven. The ministry of Michael was not necessary. Because Michael was framed to de and designed to embark on warfare. If you look at the physique of Michael, Michael is like an armory. Have you seen an armor tank? He was designed for warfare. So if you look upon Michael, you are going to see a warrior. Everything about Michael speaks of the strength of God. You know, God, can, God did not create anything that did not depict his nature. Because he cannot function outside of his nature. So even the angelic beings carry different dimensions of the natures of God. And what Michael represented was the strength of God. If you looked at Michael, you will begin to imagine what kind of strength this man is made of. This being is a totality of what strength is, what power is. And the reason for that was because he was designed to mirror the power and the almightiness of God. Gabriel, on the other hand, was designed as a reflector of the wisdom of God. You see, the wisdom of God is the template upon which everything that God designs, everything that God does, finds expression. You cannot understand the wisdom of God except it is given to you, even if you are a spirit. Hope you know that um, if you come to this camp, if you are smart, you will know, you will in a way discern what the man of God is trying to achieve. It's evident that he loves people and he wants to see people grow. He wants to raise people. So he put his money, he put his time, he put his effort. Do you understand? So if you look at it, you are not giving anything. He organized everything and said, come. So you will just know the wisdom at work. The wisdom at work is the outworking of love. A love that wants to see people grow into stature in God so that they can become responsible. It's not difficult to discern. But it's not like that with the wisdom of God. When the wisdom of God is operating, if you try to discern it from here, you will discover that what you are trying to see here is actually here. 
So when you fight here, what you are trying to fight, you are actually bringing it to pass. So if you try to understand the wisdom of God, the more you try to understand it, the more foolish you become until it is given to you. That's why the Bible said, if the princes of this world had known, they would not have crucified the, the Lord of glory. Because the wisdom that was operating was that Jesus was going to bring salvation to the world. But the devil saw that Jesus was trying to destroy what he has created, so he wanted to kill Jesus. The more he tried to kill Jesus, the more he brought that thing to pass. He thought that killing Jesus would destroy what God was doing. But he didn't know that killing Jesus was actually the gateway to open that which Jesus came to do. Because Jesus said, I, and if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. The only way Jesus was going to be lifted up is was for him to die. So Satan became the agent that carried out that thing for God. That's how the wisdom of God operated. Now, if you look at Gabriel, Gabriel is the personality of wisdom. So every time God wants to reveal a mystery, he sends Gabriel. Because through Gabriel, wisdom is manifested. However, even at that time, the operation of wisdom was not necessary. The operation of wisdom was not necessary because heaven in itself is a perpetual continuum. If you store up in heaven, you have capacity to know. Yes, because heaven is a realm of life. It's a realm of knowledge. It's a realm of understanding. The moment you are set in heaven, there are measures given to you. So anything that is going to be hid in heaven will be hid in mystery. Because heaven is a realm of knowledge. The only things you cannot know in heaven are the things that are locked in mystery. Gabriel was the salvation of the operation of the wisdom of God. But wisdom was not necessary. The only thing that was necessary at the time was the operations of worship. You see, in worship, what happens is that in worship, the greatest revelation of God is manifested in worship. That's why worship is very significant. You see, the highest revelation of God is not God. The highest revelation of God is His holiness. See, the holiness of God is a revelation of the fact that God is in His own class. He is different from every other thing. Nothing is like Him. Every other thing derives from Him. He is separated. It is in holiness that the demarcation between creation and creator is manifested. So if you see the love of God, the love of God is a revelation of His holiness. It is in the love of God that you see that God loves differently from every other kind. It is in the love of God that you can know that nothing can love like God. So love in itself is a revelation of holiness. If you see the mercy of God, it's also another dimension of the unconditional capacity of God and to accommodate. That mercy of God in itself is a manifestation of His holiness. If you see the kindness of God, it's a manifestation of His holiness. But the only way you can submit the totality of the manifest revelation of God is on the altar of worship. Because in worship, creation gives way. So that God is predestined as king. That is why the only assignment that was needed in heaven was the assignment of worship. Till today, the elders don't do anything in heaven. The Bible said they fought peace morning and evening, day and night. They sing holy. Holy is the Lord. The angels don't call him love. They don't call him kindness. They don't call him peace. They call him holy. Because when you call God holy, you have called him love. When you call God holy, you have called him peace. When you call God holy, you have called him kindness. At that time, the only ministry that was required in heaven was the ministry of Lucifer. Because Lucifer was the ranking angel that was in charge of worship. And because of this, Lucifer felt that he was special. He did not know that everything that he is and was, was a revelation of the side of God. Nobody can contain God completely. As big and mighty as he was, he was only a revelation of a kind of God. He didn't know that like him were other 12 princes. There were 12 chief princes in heaven that had the same status as he had. But because his ministry was relevant at the time, he felt that he was more significant. And pride entered his heart. And Lucifer declared, so that we are sent to heaven. You know, Lucifer was so big that even the Ephraim at that time, before man came, was committed to him. Yes. If you study the book of Isaiah chapter 14 verse 16, you hear what the Bible said. He said, Thou that shake the dead. He was operating as the prince over the Ephraim. And he was also operating the mountain of God. And suddenly, Lucifer thought in his heart that he was like God. He said that we are sent to heaven. We exalt my throne above the stars of God. And we are sent above the clouds. When you speak of the clouds, you are speaking of the glory. You see, God sits above the glory. He wants to ascend above it. He said that we are sent above the stars of God. And I will sit in the sights of the north like the most high. He didn't need to say it. The moment he altered it, God picked it from his heart. And he 
immediately he was no longer relevant. The meaning of God was invoked. <laughs> you see, when you are walking with God, you think, I hear people say, God cannot do anything with us, without us. <laughs> they don't know what sovereignty is. They don't know it. The whole of heaven depended on Lucifer. You see, the kind of worship that Lucifer organized in heaven is not this type. The Bible said, Thy pipes, thy, uh, thy pipes and thy tablets were indeed from the day of thy creation. Lucifer was so wired that he could read the emotions of God. He could read the movements of God. So when God wants to be happy, Lucifer just needs to shake and then joy will fill the temple. If God wants to laugh, Lucifer just needs to shake and the heaven will be filled with laughter. He knew God more than every other person because by reason of his service, he was connected to God intimately. But suddenly, the moment he decided to go against the legal system of heaven, he was no longer relevant. It was the first time that Lucifer understood that God does not depend on anything. That is the name I am that I am. It doesn't depend on anything. I am was invoked in heaven. The Bible said, Oh, Lucifer, thou son of the morning. He said, How art thou fallen? He said, Thou shalt be cast from the mountains of the Lord. You are cast away. He said, There is no place for you anymore. Ah, how can heaven survive without Lucifer? Heaven survives because there is the I am. The I am does not need you. You need him. Lucifer did not have this understanding. So he decided to defy the protocol of heaven. And he was cast from the mountains of God. It was when Lucifer was ejected from heaven that man became needed. You see, heaven is a realm of perpetual continuum. There's no time. It's a timeless reality. The years that Lucifer lived in heaven, we cannot tell. But let me tell you something. Before the first earth was created, Lucifer was there. When this when the first earth was created, Lucifer was there. You see, the earth, what you read in the book of Genesis chapter 1, was not the creation of heaven and earth. It was a recreation process. The Bible only mentioned it in verse 1. Everything that happened from verse 2 was recreation. It was not creation. But when Job decided to go against the holiness of God, and God showed up, he said, where were you when the songs of the morning sound into the foundations of the earth? See, the reason everything has sound, you know the honor that Lucifer had with God. Lucifer was given the honor to be the custodian of life. You see, life is coded in sound. Life is not coded in breath. It is coded in sound. And Lucifer was in charge in the harmonics of sound. So Lucifer was the regulator of life. That is why God speaks to the dead. God can speak to this ion because this ion can produce sound. Anything that has sound has life. So when God was creating the world, he said, where were you? He was talking to Job. You know, a lot of us, sometimes we try to carry out treasonable offenses. But when God shows up, you discover your holy. Job thought that because he was carrying the sacrifice, obeying the covenant, nothing should happen to him. He didn't understand that his life was actually designed by God to mirror a dimension of God. See, every circumstance you are going through, it was written before the world began. Those circumstances are the vistas through which people will know who God is. When you go through sickness and you are healed, people will now know that there is an invincible force that heals. So through you now, they understand that healing is real. The sickness is not a challenge. God allows it so that you, through your circumstances, can become a vista through which people will know who God is. He did not put the sickness on you, but he turns it out for good. That's why he say all things work together for the good of them that love him, who are called. It's a calling unto purpose. Job was being bedeviled by sickness. And instead of Job giving thanks that he is found worthy to mirror the faithfulness of God, Job began to rebel. And God showed up. He said, who, who is this that speaketh word, darkened counsel by words without knowledge? He said, where were you when I put in the foundations of the world? The things that are going on in your life now, they were written before the world began. Who told you you can change it? Your life is supposed to be a window through which people will see that God is faithful. That one should not give up with God. No matter how bad it is, the faithfulness of God speaks again. How dare you darken that which was obtained before the world began? That's why your circumstance becomes an altar of worship. But you don't know. You run away every time. God gives you a privilege to become that which his dimension will be mirrored. And you run away. You are not wise. No 
Lucifer had all of these honors in heaven and pride that is how. The moment Lucifer fell, another operation began. That was when creation became necessary for man. You see, man was hid in the archive. You see, it's not like we were not in existence. We were actually existing, but we were hid inside of God. Ah. You didn't begin the day you were born. Tell somebody, you didn't begin the day you were born. You were hid in God. See, you were hid. God had man before the world began. Because one of the attendant revelation of God is that he is the omniscient one. He knows the end from the beginning. He's called Alpha and Omega. It means beginning, end. He journeyed into the end before the beginning began. So he knew that when Lucifer fails, there was a need for another project. Because what God wants to achieve will always come to pass. And God must be worshipped so long as creation we find expression. The reason for creation is so that God is worshipped. So God created man and hid man in himself. Lucifer did not know that even when he was operational, a substitute was already in heaven. So when God began the creation of man, the Bible said, God said, let us make man in our own image. And he said, after, the light, after our own likeness, and he said, in the image of God, he created man. The word create is the word bara. Bara means to be made out of nothing. So man came from the breath of God. When Lucifer fell, what God did was that he breathed man out of himself. And for that man to operate on earth, he need to encase him in dust. Why did God choose dust this time around? Because he does not want man to go the path of Lucifer. Now, the reason Lucifer became proud was because the very making of Lucifer was made with beauty and glory. If you read the book of Ezekiel chapter 28 from verse 11, the Bible said, Thou that seated the sun. When Lucifer shows up, his brightness is more than the sun. If Lucifer stands here now, you will no longer see the sun. He is that bright. The Bible speaks that Lucifer was made of the ten precious stones. Diamond, Jasper, carbon, gold, sapphire. All the most precious stones that God ever created. That was what he gathered together to form Lucifer. And Lucifer was the definition of beauty and glory. But this time around, God did not want the glory of his creation to be external. He hid the glory inside. So the glory, who is God himself, he put it in dust. So when you look at a man, you can't see the glory until that which is on his inside comes out. That is when you see glory. In worship, what we do is that God decides to alter our orientation so that glory can come out. Worship is not an act. Falling down is not the act. Strying is not the act. The act is what God puts in place so that as you shift away, the mortality can shift so that the glory can rise. Every time we worship, what happens in the spirit is that there is an ascension of glory from our inside. That is what Lucifer did not have. Lucifer's beauty was external. So if you look at him, you could call judge him. I can't call, I can't tell the end of Chi because I don't know Chi. If Chi did manifest, he's bigger than this country. That's how it is. So he said, God has given the treasure in 18 verses so that the excellency of the glory will be of God, not of man. When you see man operating now, you won't make the mistake to ascribe it to him. You will know that, no, what is happening is something inside. The technology that is operational here is beyond what I'm seeing. It's something inside. When you see Lucifer operating, you can give him the glory. But you can never give the glory to man. Because the glory is in empty vessel. What you see has no value. But what is coming out, you must ascribe it to God. That was the wisdom that encased the, 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 the creation of man. Man was created for a purpose. You know, I told you redemption was not necessary. Redemption became necessary because man fell again. The reason redemption became necessary was because man fell. So if your own, if your if all you know about the gospel is what God has done for you, then you don't know the reason why you were made. That's why you see people doing all kinds of things on the street today. They don't know why they were made. In the book of Genesis, chapter 2. From verse 15, the Bible said, And God created, planted a garden in the east side of Eden. And he put the man there. He said he put the man there to cultivate it and to keep it. The word cultivate or nurture is a prophetic word. The word keep is also a prophetic word. There are two spheres of assignment. The first assignment is God word. The second assignment is earth word. The God word assignment is a an intercessory assignment, a prophetic assignment. That means man to cultivate that garden 
you must always keep the garden synchronized with God. Because it is the pouring, the outpouring of God upon the garden that will keep the garden. So the first assignment of man is to hook up to God in fellowship. And so long as the man is hooked up to God in fellowship, creation will be preserved. The second assignment was for the man to extend the influence of God that comes upon the creation and dominate the world. So that the garden will no longer be on the east side of Eden. But a point will come where the whole earth will become the garden of the Lord. That's why our assignment is for the fellowshipping or hooking up with the Lord and then for the domination of the world. It is when the extent to which you carry out that assignment that will determine where you will sit in the banquet. That's what you were not taught. This gospel you have been taught, if you walk with it, you will go to heaven and discover you are a nobody. Where you will be is what? A function of the degree to which you carry out your assignment in keeping and cultivating the garden. Are we together? However, man, man, but thank God. You see, David was carried in the spirit and then he heard a deliberation in the angelic realm. You see, when he heard that deliberation, him himself now sat down and he began to contemplate. You see, the deliberation in the angelic realm was that the angels were wondering, why does God love man so much? They didn't understand. Why does God love this man so much? The angels, they keep deliberating, they keep deliberating. So David, when he picked it by, prophet, by prophetic name, himself now went for the first time and sat down. And he began to look at the stars. He looked at the heavenly bodies. He looked at the world. And he asked himself, he said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? He said, what is man that thou visitest him? He said, you made him a little lower than, the word there is not angel. The word there is Elohim. He said, you made, you see, the people who were translating the Bible, they felt that God, how can man be lower than only God? They are the angels, not bigger than man. So they were the ones that put angel there. If you go and check the Hebrew word, it's Elohim. See, in the operational structure of creation, man is next to God. That's the atomic authority. He said, you made it a little lower than the Elohim. Why? Why? Somebody said, why? It's because of service. You see, the angels, according to their design, they can't know God. They cannot what? They cannot know God. They know, they only know about God. The only creation that has the capacity to know God is man. You know why? The only way God can be known is by his spirit. And man is the only one that carries the Holy Spirit. So the Bible said in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 that the angels are watching the church to teach them the manifold wisdom of God. So every time the angels see God show love to man, they will just lie down and say holy. We don't know why, but you are, you are, you are sovereign, holy. The same offense that Lucifer carried out, man carried out the same offense. And God now chose to become like a creation and save man. When they look at it, they lie down, they say, holy. You see, you go and sin, and then you come back and you say, Lord, I'm sorry. And the next thing, God embraces you. Ah, they lie down, they say, holy. You see, when Jesus was telling the prodigal son, see, the, the, the parables that Jesus told were heavenly mysteries. A child deserted the father, squandered the father's resources. And the moment the father saw the child, the father didn't wait for the child to apologize. He ran and hugged him. Ah, the angels say holy. So it is what we say about God that they hear and learn. So it is man that says God is light. It is man that says God is love. It is man that says God is kind. It is man that says God is useful. It is man that says God is peace. Is man that begins to describe God to the angels. So one of the duties of the church is to teach the angels about God. 
it is the highest honor in the kingdom but the more of god you will know it is the more of him that you interact with because god is known by his spirit that's why you can quote the whole scripture but you don't know god it's an experiential reality the greek word for it is epignosis see when you know about god it's called gnosis in scripture gnosis is knowledge you come about by gathering data analysis but as you begin to walk with the lord you begin to have disclosures it's called epignosis god begins to open itself to you and then as you begin to mingle with god you travel from epignosis to gnosko in gnosko what god is you now are so you you don't just know it anymore you have become a manifestation of it the more you become it when people see you they see god that is how you begin to colonize your world because the reason god designed it like that is so that you can preserve his creation creation has no preservation except as man arises that's why the bible said the endless expectation of creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of god the reason god allows you to come into him is so that he can derive pleasure through that interaction with you and so that through you he can provide and defend the integrity of creation that is what we call the kingdom in the kingdom you become the functionary that stands for god and the only way you can do that is to put away your appetite is to put away your desires so that through you god is manifested the question is how many of us are manifesting god today you know you don't know what jesus had to go through for you to become who you are the bible said the prophets of old he said they searched the scriptures diligently to find out when these things will come to pass and he said even the angels they desire to look they try to peep when they were talking about redemption you see the angels try to peep go and read first peter chapter 1 verse 9 see creation is the biggest redemption is the biggest news in creation when the angels heard about it that god wanted to save man the bible said they peeped they tried to peep into what god was trying to do and he said jesus endured the shame for the glory that will be revealed do you know who that glory is is you and i the reason jesus endured the shame was for you and i we are the revelation of the glory of god see the glory of god is no just no longer a cloud it's not just a cloud anymore the glory of god is man and the reason for it is that jesus paid the price to attain the claims of divine justice for jesus to do that he had to relinquish the status of god and become a man that's the doctrine of the incarnation he did not stop there he had to die the death of a criminal have you imagined what it would be like maybe they say ah, they want to save the ant kingdom now and they said <laughs> i said apostle here should become an ant and go to change to save the ant kingdom do you know the plights that ants go through so he will now start when rain falls now he will be digging sand so that he will live inside sand jesus suffered the highest shame then he died now the significance of the death of jesus the significance of the incarnation and the death of jesus are enormous now Without the incarnation, the claims of divine justice could not have been attained. Because a corrupt Lord cannot save another corrupt Lord. And even if you find a man that does not have corruption, he doesn't have the stature that is required to save the world. So the only way that was going to happen was for God to carry out the biggest sacrifice, which was to become man, so that he would become flesh and blood in order to save man. So Jesus became flesh and blood in order to save man. Now, because of that incarnation, you and I now have ability to participate in the spirit because you know somebody said the son of god became the son of the son of men so that the sons of men can become the sons of god it's very true yes that is because because jesus partook of our nature we are now called to participate in his nature so he said according as his divine power has made all things what according as his divine power have made all things happy with the scripture now he said me first peter chapter 1 verse 3 and he said 
through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. He said, he has given us these exceeding great and precious promises that by them we might escape the corruption that is in the world through love. So he gave us capacity to participate in divinity. That's why Jesus said, for somebody who is born again, he said, this is his new nature. We also enjoy the incarnation. But our own incarnation is from flesh to spirit. Jesus' incarnation is from spirit to flesh. But ours is from flesh to spirit. So Jesus said, like the wind bloweth. And that mistress comes from whence it cometh or where it goeth. He says, so are they that are born by the spirit of God. So you now, because of the corridor of incarnation, you can now become a spirit reality. You can now participate in the spirit. The death of Jesus, what it does for you is that he kills the old man. He judges the old creation. So the Bible said, because Jesus died and was buried, he said, you too, you are dead. It is that death of Jesus that makes you escape the penalty of sin. Because the law of the spirit is that the wages of sin is death. So you and I must have to die. But the only way we died was in Christ. So the death of Jesus gives you the pedestal and the opportunity for you to also enjoy death in Christ. So you have now escaped the messianic judgment. And it does not stop there. The power of sin is also broken from your life. Because you are no longer of the old stock. The old stock has been judged. It has died and it has been buried. But it doesn't stop there. Where does Christianity begin from? Christianity does not begin in the incarnation. It does not begin in the death. It begins in the resurrection. That's why Christianity is the victorious life. In the resurrection, what God does is that it infuses in you the seed of immortality. So every one of us has become immortal entities. You know, sometimes when we are praying and then we begin to talk about the immortals, the immortals, all you imagine are angels. No. You are also an immortal. Yes. Do you not know that right now there are some saints, spirit of just men made perfect, who are operating in heaven like the cherubs of glory. When John went to heaven, it was not an angel that carried him around heaven. It was a man that ascended to glory. John wanted to worship him and he said, No, I am like unto you. I'm also of your brethren. I'm a brethren like you. We are also immortals. I read a book, The Maharishi of Mount Kailash. He was an Indian intercessor. The Spirit of God carried him into a cave, a far cave in Mumbai, India. And he has been there for 400 years. Death could no longer come upon him. Through intercession, he entered into immortality. Oftentimes, spirit of just men come to visit him. St. Francis of Assisi, they come to visit him in the tree. They interact with them. It is a, you know what Jesus said? There are some standing here who will not taste of death. You think that is a, an allegorical statement. You know, it's a literal statement. The man said he saw John, the beloved. There is no record of the death of John. He was sentenced to the Isle of Patmos to die. But he didn't die. See, today he's alive. And if you think he's alive, go and read the book of Luke, chapter 2, from verse 17. The Bible said, God told the prophet, he said, you will not taste of death until you see the consummation of Israel. The mortal body now has ability to keep immortality. In fact, during the rapture, what will happen is that the church will hit the revelation of immortality. You see, we have hit the revelation of healing. So healing is now commonplace. We have hit the revelation of prosperity. Prosperity is commonplace. A time will come. You know, First Timothy chapter 1 verse 10 says, God has revealed life and immortality through Jesus. A time will come when the church will know immortality and people will choose when they want to go to heaven. Yes. Yes. You can say me, I will be here for 120 years and then no devil can kill you. Because you have seen the revelation of immortality. Elijah did not die. He was carried to glory. Enoch did not die. He was carried to glory. Glory to God. So that is the revelation of the resurrected Christ. That revelation gives you ability to live above sin. And then you have the revelation of the ascension. Jesus had to ascend to heaven. The reason Jesus ascended was so that you and I can continue his ministry. You wouldn't have had the authority. See, Every time this man of God is preaching, it's Jesus that is preaching. As I'm preaching now, it's the work of Jesus I'm doing. The prophets of old, they spoke about Jesus' coming. We are not speaking about Jesus. We are representing Jesus. That's the difference in the dispensation. 
the people of old were prophesying the coming we are not talking about jesus see when you go to speak to somebody about salvation eternal life does not come from heaven it comes out of your spirit because as he is so are you now in this world see there are three questions of redemption the first question is who have believed our report the second question is unto whom is the arm of the lord revealed the third question is who shall declare his generation what we are doing is that we are declaring his generation that's why we are bold to enter into territories of darkness and we speak because when we speak the bible said the lord confirmed the words of his servant he performed the counsel there is not all the time that we give prophetic words that we hear sometimes we don't hear we decree it and it's established that's how we take over territories we come to territories and we judge the princes of the land you come to a territory and you say every soul in this land receives jesus people like john Knox stood up and said lord give me scotland or i die and he caused the revival in scotland that's how we advance the kingdom you come into your office there are people there who are boasting of charm there are people there they say no this thing doesn't happen here this, this is our culture here what do you mean you put an end to it because when you show up jesus has shown up all of that authority you have is because of the ascension that is why jesus did not give gifts to men until he was ascended he said him that ascended the same was the one that descended and when he ascended he gave gifts unto men some he said they will be apostles the apostles are the ones that carry the mandate of the kingdom to different territories so when an apostle shows up it's not a title coming it's a kingdom coming it's a kingdom coming when an apostle shows up he plans a kingdom he raised his people and suddenly men begins to call upon the name of the lord he says some will be prophets this one has the capacity to tap into heaven and they tell you this is what god wants to do now and because the authority begins to happen you could be going through crisis for 10 years and then the prophet shows up and he says say need 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 it's not a big word but because he has uttered it what he has done is that he has connected you to him and the resources of heaven begins to power you that was how moses operated jacob was one of the patriarchs of old jacob caused reuben but when moses showed up by the prophetic oil moses said let reuben leave let reuben leave let reuben leave they say your family ladies don't get married ah they have failed they came late you show up and you say everyone get married I did not have this understanding. My elder sister, one was 34, two were 32. And I showed up. I said, get married before this year run out. Three of them are married with children. The moment light hits you, you enter into authority. In the ascension, what happens in the ascension is that you begin to live on earth from heaven. The reason Jesus had authority on earth was because the Bible said, the son of man, which is in heaven. He was walking on earth, but he was living from heaven. And the Bible said, he that is from above is above all. The ascension gives you opportunity to leave from heaven. So every time you speak, you are speaking from heaven. Every time you move, heaven is moving. There are times when we come to places, people are demonized. As you look upon them, the demon leave. The demon leave. You don't need to command the hell. You now have understanding of the ascension. When you show up, heaven goes. I came with an entourage of angels. There are some meetings that I attend. And as I just mount the altar, I see an angel run through the people. Then the power of God begins to move. I don't even say anything. They don't know me for God's sake. I just came there for the first time. That is because of the ascension. The ascension gives you authority. Authority with God. Authority to shape the lives of people. I've come to places where people are immoral. I rebuke. I say I judge the spirit of iniquity. And they have a turnaround. I learned it from John G. Lake. John G. Lake will see somebody who is alcoholic. Giving to addiction. And he places his hand on the person and he breaks the siege of addiction. He doesn't need counseling. He dies. That's the power of ascension. The enthronement is what orchestrates the supply of the spirit. It's because of the enthronement that we have the Holy Ghost. So every time that you want more of the supply of the spirit to interact with the king, the more you see him as Lord, the more the spirit is supplied. That's what I was teaching yesterday. In obedience, what we do is that we proclaim Jesus as Lord. And the more you proclaim him as Lord, the more the spirit is supplied. So sometimes you just come and you say to people, you are blessed. They don't know why their life changed. Sometimes you are traveling in a motor car because you sat with a man, a course is broken. The guy will, not, will never even know that you broke the course. He doesn't know because it's the supply of the spirit. You come to a place and then you just shake hands with people. 
that you shook hands with them, their lives changed. We've had those testimonies once and again. Sometimes God wants you to know. Because God wants to register the consciousness, He allows something supernatural to happen so that He will consciously transmit. You know, transmission is a conscious thing. You transmit consciousness. We went to pray for a woman that was crippled. Prayed down the power of God. She got up and began to walk. And seven demons left her. In fact, before she walked, the woman that was afraid and broken was moving on her and knees like a dog and back. Energy. The demon left her. She began to walk. When we came out from there, me and the pastors that went were just strolling. And then we just came to the house. And then as I was shaking people, they were falling down. That was the first time I saw the dimension. I didn't know what was happening. They were, they, they passed us, they were shaking. I just, sister, where do And then people were calling that. I now stopped shaking people. And the Holy Ghost whispered. He said, I want you to know that you are a carrier of the blessing. You are a carrier of the blessing. So now when I touch people, I do it consciously. Because I now know that I am a carrier of the blessing. The blessing travels in the spirit. So if you want to dominate your world, what you need to do is that become more interwoven with the spirit. The more you engage in intimacy with the Holy Ghost, the more He breaks out. That's how you change your world. The gospel of the kingdom is the unveiling of Jesus as the Lord. Lord in your life, Lord in your system where you belong. That is the gospel that we are called men to preach. That gospel requires responsibility. Because everything Jesus did was in your spirit. It's a legal thing. For you to make it a, an experiential reality, you must take up responsibility. Because what Jesus did did not happen in your soul. It did not happen in your body. If your soul is born again, you become an imbecile. Because there will be no information there anymore. So God did not born again your soul. It was your spirit that was born again. And everything God has, He put it in your spirit by the Holy Ghost. So the Bible said, He that is joined with the Lord is one spirit. But what God wants to achieve is that that reality that is in your spirit will permeate your soul permeate your body and permeate your circumstance. For that to happen, you need time to fast. You need time to fellowship. You need time to pray. That's where responsibility comes into the gospel. Because you were not, you were not saved by works, but you were saved unto good works. It is in your good work that you advance the kingdom. Some people say, come on, I don't need to fast. Why do I need to fast? If you don't need to fast, you will have God in your spirit, but they will not, they will not manifest in your soul. Because your soul is full of sin and iniquity. The word of God needs to enter your soul again and again. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it said, We all with unveiled faces, beholding us in a glass, the image of the Lord, we are changed. The word is metamorphosis. Your soul is restored. A point comes where you can feel when the power of God seeps through your soul. You can feel it on your body. Because your body is mortified. See, those desires, they die. The Spirit of God mortifies them. But for it to happen, you must constantly engage the spirit realm. What do we do in prayers? In prayers, what we do is that we collide with God. And we allow Him to permeate us. That's why it's, it's conversation. As you talk with Him, you pour yourself to Him. And then the point comes, you listen, He pours Himself to you. So what happens is that the soul we did not have this experience of salvation, we now begin to have it. We now begin to have it. So suddenly you go to the place of prayer and you come out strong. You don't see any limitation again. If you leave that intensity go down, the things you were confronting yesterday, you will see them today and run. Because that's the state of the soul. The soul needs constant reinvigoration by the Spirit of God. That's why we pray. He say, you dearly beloved, building up yourself upon your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. As you pray in the Holy Ghost, the point comes when you hit the zenith of your faith. And then that time, God begins to talk to you. How about Boko? How about Dubai? How about Mozambique? Then at that point, you now begin to speak over nations. You must first of all rise before you can raise me. Prayer helps you to rise. Rise up in God. Then the point comes where you come to your family and then you speak words. That's when the Bible says, Savior shall arise from Mount Zion. See, everything around you will be there until you take the responsibility of the kingdom. And if you don't take that responsibility, what will happen is that you will not just lose out in God, but a day will come in eternity. God will point to you that this one, the one who was supposed to save you, for that day when you saw him, I asked you to talk to him, you refused. So for that, you won't have this problem. This one, 
you were the one who was supposed to deliver her. But I told you three days ahead to fast so that you will have faith to confront that demon. But you refused. So this lady was tormented for ten more years. Those ten years that she missed, it was your fault. Do you know the Bible said to Ezekiel, he said, if I tell a wicked man, you will die. And you do not tell him, I will demand his blood of your hand. We are called on to priestly responsibilities. These things must dominate you until life itself does not have meaning anymore. Paul said, if it's for him, he wants to go to heaven now. He said, the reason is because of you. It's for your own benefit. Have you come to a point where you are living because of what God wants you to do? Or you are just living because you love life? Love life. Lord, keep me, keep me. It's a time for people to arise. You are not standing up in the night to pray because you have a problem. You are standing up in the night to pray because you want to stop the operations of witches and wizards. That time that you raise those insects, it blocks things in the spirit. You are rising up in the night to pray because that young man going to that dear parlor, a time has come for him to stop. You are rising up in the night to pray because that prostitute lady, you want her to enter into her destiny in God. That's when you begin to live the life of God. The life of God is the life of sacrifice. You live for others. You live for purpose. You live for ordination. The ordinations have been calling. It has been beckoning upon you. How long will this man of God be the only one facing this altar? When will you rise up and say, no, 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 no. There is something happening in Udi. Let's go there. When will you rise up and say, there is something happening in Usuka. Let's go there. It is time for you to become militant. It is a calling unto a militant spirit. The Bible said in the day of the Lord, he said, men shall arise by horses. He calls some of them war horses. He calls some of them race horses. He calls some of them show horses. Who are you in the spirit? Paul say, henceforth, we know no man after the flesh. It's time for you to put your beauty aside. You are not the only beautiful one. It's time for you to come out of your depression. You are not the only ugly person. It does not take beauty or ugliness to achieve it. It is a writing code that has been engrafted in your spirit. God knew you were going to do it. He had faith in you. Who told you you had the right to disbelieve yourself? The one that made you say you could do it. Who told you you cannot? It's a deception from the devil. Can you rise up in the spirit and ask the Lord for the strength that is required to bet your ordination? A lot of people are in bondage because you have not risen. How long will the bondage continue? And this expectation of creation waited the manifestations of the sons of God. The Bible said you die like men, you fall like the princes because you know not. I come to tell you tonight that heaven had already prepared you. Before you came, it was written. You are just discovering it. It was written in the spirit. The devil knows that's why he has been fighting you. Because your star reveals it. Before Jesus was born, the devil had gone ahead to truncate the process so that he would not be born. After Jesus was born, the devil still went and truncated the process. The reason you have been fought intensely is because they know the day your destiny breaks out. Oh my God. A nation is in for a deliverance. Most of the people that you see doing mighty things for God, they were not even in the cities. They were far, hidden away from civilization. But when the light of God begins to shine, it begins to draw men. It begins to draw men. It begins to draw men. Maybe you started the prayer as one man. Tomorrow a friend walks in and sees you praying and he wants to join you. Tomorrow he brings his friend. Next tomorrow you are 50. Next tomorrow you are 100. And next time you are looking for a place where you will pray. Next time you are beginning to send men. You are beginning to send men. And then they begin to wonder, is this not Chinenye? Is this not Onyenye? Is this not charity? No, 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 no. The one you are seeing now is a God. God has risen on his inside. God has risen on his inside. Hey! Oh, I wish we could allow God. The Bible said Jesus stands on the door, knocking on the heart of men. Will you look away from yourself for one more time? How long will you look at your limitations? Moses was a stammerer, yet God sent him to deliver a nation. Can you look away? knows you cannot pray, yet he calls you a prophet. He knows you cannot fast, yet he calls you an apostle. God knows you are poor, yet he calls you a governor. When will you receive the prophetic word over your life? Ah! The 
word of God is so potent. Sometimes when you don't have the energy, what God does is that He allows a mantle of another man to come upon you. The Bible said in the book of Songs of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 4, it says on the mountain of the Lord, there are shoots, shields of a thousand warriors. Even if you cannot achieve it, a mantle can rest upon you. So mama super kateko Ereteke borobondo sate Mando sopra teka boraska Ereteke borobondo It's time to drink of another waters It's time to drink of another waters It's time to drink of another waters Sopra sapa teke boa Ereteke borobondo sapa tenas Rapa pare de tombo te para bapa bapa Alege bondo sopra Oh, 
هللويا هللويا there's a young man pay attention now there's a young man here listen God is about to do something see there's a young man here pay attention even if you are there's a young man here I see you having continuous non-stop interaction with the Holy Spirit now this interaction is usually heightened when you are on bike in fact the inspiration keep bombarding your head different lights from scriptures keep breaking but you have not developed the habit of writing down the Lord is telling me that he is raising you as a prophetic teacher where is that young man? I want to use it as a point of contact to release something on the people constant interaction with the Holy Ghost especially when you are on bike scriptures begin to open scriptures begin to open but you don't have a habit of documenting the Lord says he's raising you a prophetic teacher I want to use I want to use you now to impact the people so that the grace that has come upon one may come upon all because he sent his word to Jacob and he lightened upon Israel lift your hands toward heaven lift your hands what God was trying to achieve was to open you into a dimension a dimension where angels put you scriptures you have been receiving whispers but from now you are not just going to hear but you begin to see the angels that come to teach you Holy Spirit pay attention in the congregation as the fire rests on them it will touch people there Lord Jesus after the count of three one two three take it take it take it let it descend let it be stronger 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 there's an equipping going on there's an equipping an equipping going on right now I can see a young lady listen oh my Jesus Oh my Jesus. Listen, listen. There's a young lady here now. Listen. There's a young lady here. The healing oil has been in your hands since you were a child. Pay attention. The healing oil has been in your hands since you were a child. When you pray for the sick, you find yourself crying, crying. Now, this is what the Lord is saying. When you pray for the sick, you find yourself crying. And then most times when you pray or worship God, sometimes it's as if you hear sounds and you are even afraid. You feel afraid sometimes because of the presence that comes. The Lord wants to activate you into the office of the court this morning. Where is that lady tonight? This morning. Where is that lady? You are the one. Oh, oh my Jesus. Rapatekoborobundus. Serapate ke bonde se frata Risca fra la schiro parabante Beres ka brata kiros Rete perendo se patelia Mante ki borada bas Rafa paro bonde sapate Mente se prekido para gadas See there is an equipping going on in the spirit Refuse to be distracted Pray the Holy Ghost Focus on Jesus
that man of God spoke of the release of the psalmist anointing. The Lord began to give me words. But I didn't want to interrupt the ministration. The Lord told me there's a young lady here that predominantly you receive songs from God. You receive songs from God, but you've lost them. You've lost the songs. In fact, the songs the Lord has given you, if those songs will have to be sung by now, you would have gone far in life. He said, but demons come and steal them from you. The Lord wants to place something on you this morning. Let's the lady come. You see, sometimes when men of God speak these things, it's because God is out to ordain. I see you writing many songs, many songs, but you have lost them. Demons come to steal them from you. And most of your songs are supposed to be songs for deliverance. They are deliverance songs. Songs that pierce through the soul. But you've lost them. Demons stole them from you. The covenant keeping God. The covenant keeping God. The covenant keeping God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we speak in tongues for just five seconds? I'm losing. I'm losing the vision. Can you speak in tongues for a few seconds? I'm losing. A vision just flew past. And I'm losing it. Hallelujah. 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 I'll just try to describe. I'll try to I'll try to describe what I've seen. We need to save a woman. I'll try to describe what I've seen. The vision just it flew past and I couldn't really lay hold on it very well. I've seen a family. Family of about two persons thereabouts. 
the father of the home was cut off. And since then, the woman has been in depression. In fact, right now she's having a problem around her chest, like a heart issue. And um, I think the person represented here is a lady or something. I can't, can't get the date teachers very well. It's having an issue like a heart. And every, every child of the house is now so concerned that it has become the reason why you cannot leave home. Cannot leave home. I don't know if I got this description clearly, but if you are in that category, can you come? The family. The woman now, there's, a, there's an attack on her chest. Sometimes it's as if she's losing her breath. Losing her breath. Demons have come to truncate. Demons have come to truncate. Can you stretch your hands over them? And release the judgment of God against the root of that thing. Go so that we lay hands on them, and that report will be brought away. He has some authority over this realm. is happening. I don't know why. So many angelic simulations. As if before you see what's happening, God before you see what's happening, God maybe that's why the visions are diffusing so fast. I'll just try to describe. You know sometimes when you see these things you need the spirit of wisdom to tell you what the interpretation. They're just floating. 
I just perceive in my spirit. Listen. Say sometimes when you are operating in the spirit, you need to know when God spoke and when you pick. Alright? I just perceive in my spirit that there is somebody here. Your auntie has been married for five, getting to six years now. But there has been no issue. And it has become a source of concern. I just perceived in my spirit. You see, a lot of things are happening. A lot of things are happening. Get the time frame that was witness to my spirit. I just perceived in my spirit. Is there anybody here like that? See the, see the time that I gave. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying 10 years. I said for 5 to 6 years. That's the witness that came to my spirit. Alright? If your auntie is looking for a child, we can join faith with her. But the one being I perceive, the Bible said, the perception says for five to six years, there will be no issue and it has become a challenge. Join faith now for the Lord to visit. See the time frame I gave? Man of God, please. Oh, I will decree over them. Let the church stretch forth our hands to this one as we we'll join faith with our brethren to pass declarations to open up the womb of men. Let's join faith and stretch forth our hearts. The Lord will begin with them here as an indication of what He is doing. I see two of them that right now something is happening to you and it's happening to that relation of yours that we are talking about. Join faith. Come on. I'm looking at all of them. You are fully aware that that relation of yours has gone into diabolical means. Diabolical means to see to it that the baby will come out. But I hear God say, children are the heritage of His Majesty. The fruit of the womb, this is the reward. They will have mercy upon you because the oracles of God has declared it. He that performed the counsels of the sisters. How shall these things be? For the spirit of the most high will rest upon you. Suddenly that relation of yours will begin to feel lodgings in her spirit. Suddenly she will begin to find strong inclinations to serve the will of God. She, in fact, I see one of them will go and join departments in church. I'm seeing service. Through service, one of them, something will come out of her. Oh, hold your belly, all of you. Hold your belly, all of you. Hold your belly. Your belly. Just hold it. Hold your womb. Hold your womb. Those of you that came out, hold your word. Hold your breath. Oh, Jesus. 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 The mercy of God locates your relation. The mercy of God locates her wherever she is. I will form a baby in the womb. We create it. 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 According to the time of life, the cry of a baby will be heard in that family. 
and the birthing forth of that child will mark the end of the mockings of darkness for that family. And so shall it be. Oh, fellow couple, to skip out us out. Hallelujah. Is there anybody here that has complication with the left ear or something? Complication. Complication with the left ear. Yes. The Lord just told me. The complication with the left ear. Left ear. A young man. A young man. Complication with the left ear. How many of you? You have issues with hearing? Or there's pain, itches inside, some kind of complication. If you are healed, will you know? If you are healed now, will you know? Can you verify now that you are healed? Alright, put your left hand there. Put your left hand there. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I rebuke that spirit of infirmity. That has plagued your ears, left ears. I command that plague to end now. I command the plague to end now. Healed in Jesus' name. 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 I command this ear be restored. Be restored. Healed in Jesus' name. Healed in Jesus' name. Healed in Jesus' name. Instantly, instantly be healed in Jesus' name. Healed in Jesus' name. Healed in Jesus' name. Healed in Jesus' name. Come out of our ear. 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 Come out in the name of Jesus. Out of her. Out. 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 Out in the name of Jesus. Get out of her in Jesus' name. Come out. I command the ear. Be restored. Open up. Restored. Open up. In the name of Jesus. Come out. Get them off. What are you doing? Come. Come on, come. Before my ear normally pains me. How do you feel now? Okay, completely Are you sure you are here? Are you sure? And you are just watching like that? Show me. Give the Lord a bow. The Lord. The Lord. What was wrong with you? Silent place, you hear sound. Okay, go to a silent place and verify and come back. Any other person? Where were the people that were prayed for? Come up. How many persons? What was wrong with you? Now here, blocks and open. How do you feel now? It's open now. Are you feeling you feel an opening now? And you feel you are healed. Thank you, Father. It's done. Which other person? How, what was wrong with you here? When I yawned, it's like my yawn. 
time you yawn, you get knock. Yawn now. Oh, ha. When you try to yawn, When she tries to even yawn on her own, it happens. So check. Okay, what? Let's die, let's die. Do it and come, let's get to know what's happening. Go to minister again. Any other person? How many persons you were paid for? You were paid for? What was wrong with your ear? It, it itches you as well, sir. Were you feeling the itch when you came? Come and go. Or when you were paid for, how did you come? Please enter your ear. Our ears were blocked. But while prayers were going on, please enter that ear. Who knows what the Holy Ghost is? If the wind of the Spirit passes on the field, and that affliction is cost forever. Cost forever. Cost forever. Cost forever. Cost forever. Lord, the Lord is doing something. See, I wanted to tell you that there were persons with inter- of internal organ challenges. That was the next ministration I would go to. But before I would, I could finish, God's servant saw angels descending to this place with body parts, with body. Those with internal organ, I'm seeing livers restore. Go back and carry out a liver functioning test. Go back and carry out. Where are the people that even have these challenges? Let's minister specifically. You will go back and carry out a liver functioning test and discover you are totally made whole. Can you lift your hands toward heaven? Oh Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Oh my soul, brasoto paragapatekos. Lebres kevrendo rababidos kabrastas. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I declare everyone under the sound of my voice, made whole in Jesus' name. Let there be healing of livers, healing of kidney, blood infections completely healed in the name of Jesus. I command every share in your body restored right now in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and shout glory to God and receive your healing. Give me a hot phrase, a hot phrase for five minutes. A hot phrase. What's the most violent phrase you have here? The choir people. What's the most violent, most violent praise song you have here? For five, five minutes. Meanwhile, how do you feel? Is the sound still there? Touch! You are about to dance. 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 This song is not hot. You are good and your mercy is forever. You are good and your mercy is forever. You are good and your mercy is forever. You are good and your mercy is Oh, <laughs> 
you know why I asked you to dance? You know why I asked you to dance? The Holy Ghost just told me, listen, the Holy Ghost just told me to release upon you such that He has given me. Wait, let me tell you something. You don't know what I'm talking about. I have not, I have not entered one tenth of what's of my life. See, sometimes I pray for God to help me. This man standing in front of you, Benihim has imparted me. I was on, at passing on the torch in Rehan Bonke's meeting. I received an impartation from him. Bishop David Wedeko has imparted me. Reverend Chris Oyakilomi has ministered to me. Dr. Paul and Enche have anointed my head. See, you don't know what I'm telling you. Apostle, Apostle Arome Osai has laid hands on me over and over. When I te- see, Apostle Randy Clark has laid hands, I knelt in his front, he laid hands on me and said, operate in the glory realm of the anointing. You don't even know Randy Clark. He's the one that wrote the forward in the school of the seers. But White, a street evangelist in the U.S., he, he gives people, he has laid, I knelt in his laid hands on me. The oil of my life, I have not begun to operate in the world. But if that oil is imparted in you, you can see there is grace for overtaking the spirit. You can go ahead of me ten times and maximize it. Are you with me? The spirit of God says, what he has put on me, I should release it on people. When you dance, you show gratitude and you connect to things. By the time I'm releasing it, it may be what Benihim put on me that will rest on you. Benihim is the most important minister in the world. He has worked with most ministers of the gospel than any other. I know what I'm telling you. It is time for something to fall upon the people. You need to watch God until you forget yourself. Then something will drop when I release the word. Sometimes we are wrong. You know, I felt when you are grateful and you are shouting. The Lord said to be a quiet atmosphere. Alright? So we will take it very gently. And as you begin to worship God, it will begin to seep into your spirit. Gradually. Don't try to act. Don't try to act. He said it will be a quiet atmosphere. I got it wrong. Alright? And we take a very slow worship song. You may want to repent before the Lord. You may want to, you may wish to repent in your heart.
the song on the keyboard. Just the keyboard. Can you play the song on just the keyboard? Very quietly, slowly. Just be quiet in your spirit. And allow the Lord sit through you now. Father, thank you for your people. Thank you because you've looked upon their hearts and you've seen the purity of purpose. Thank you because by an act of your sovereign power, you have decided to release a measure of your grace upon them. Just as you do, O God, of the spirit that was upon Moses and placed on them. By the permission of your servant, who is the set, of the set man over this commission, ask that your spirit be parted upon them. I ask, O God, now that let there be a performance. Thou that performeth the counsel of the Spirit, thou that enacts the policies in the realms that governs the operations of the Spirit, thou that walketh the dimensions of heaven, thou that orchestrates and powers the dynamic operations of the Spirit, thou that governs the wind, thou that dictates the movements of life, I ask that there be a performance, there be a release of your Spirit of God. You see, it has begun now. It has begun. It has begun. Just look at Jesus in your heart. It's beyond falling down. Beyond falling down, my sisters. Beyond falling down, my brothers. I will say, when the Spirit is poured upon us from on high. Oh my God. It's time for the wilderness to turn into a fruitful field. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. 
I hope you enjoyed this video and I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video, and you don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and personal Savior, I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.